can be continued only if the armed forces are fed by Russia in the third year of the war. There is no doubt that if we take out of the country what we need, many millions of people will be starved to death. So stated Hermann Goering, summarizing German policy towards the Soviet Union. Many tens of millions in the industrial areas will become redundant and will either die or have to emigrate to Siberia. The launch of Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June 1941, was Germany's most desperate gamble of the Second World War. It was a gamble Hitler felt compelled to take if his dreams of the complete subjugation of Europe were to become a reality. The result was the commitment of three million troops four-fifths of Germany's total to the most atrocious conflict in the history of warfare. Other consequences would last well beyond the peace of 1945. Consequences which would shape global politics for the next five decades and bring the planet to the precipice of nuclear conflict on more than one occasion. In 1941, the conquest of Russia would not only have provided Germany with the agricultural and industrial supplies to ensure Hitler's mastery of Europe, it would simultaneously rid him of the only military power capable of challenging his domination. The death of tens of millions of Russians was not only an economic necessity. Their destruction would pave the way for the gross wrong a concept already under development by Heinrich Himmler as the culmination of Hitler's call for Lebensraum. The Grossraum was envisaged as a gigantic Germanic state stretching from the Atlantic Ocean in the west to the mountains of the Urals in the east. The Grossraum would be ruled by the master race of Germans, served by the more acceptable of the subhumans within its borders, but eliminating those like the Slavs and Jews believed too irredeemably decadent to survive. Once established, this superstate would provide Hitler with the ideal platform for his ultimate aim, the complete domination of the world. The day will come when even here in Germany, what is known as nationalism will cease to exist. What will take its place in the world will be a universal society of masters and slaves. Standing between Hitler and the realization of this vision were the armies of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. A fighting force whose condition of unpreparedness paid tribute to the paranoia of its political leadership and the excesses of a state which vied with Germany in the extent of its totalitarian oppression. While Hitler Having dealt with his political opponents during the Night of the Long Knives was, by the late 30s, industriously nurturing the development of Germany's armed forces, Stalin was busily destroying Russia's. In 1936, Marshal Tukhachevsky, chief of staff of the Russian army, was executed for treason following a trial which lasted only a single day. Six of the eight generals forming the court-martial which condemned him were themselves to be executed soon after. By the end of the purge, the Russian army had lost three of the five remaining marshals of the Soviet Union. <laughs> 
all 11 deputy ministers of defense, 75 of the 80 members of the military Soviet, all the commanders of the military districts, 13 of the 15 army commanders, more than half the corps commanders, and approximately 30% of the officers below brigade level. In Germany, Hitler singled out the Jews as the scapegoats for the nation's failure to achieve its true destiny. In Russia, Stalin put millions of people on trial accused of sabotaging the Soviet Union's industrial growth. Between 1930 and 1932, five million peasants who resisted the imposition of collective farming were exiled or sent to labor camps. Catholic and Orthodox priests, Soviet commissars, peasant farmers, Ukrainian nationalists, and ordinary industrial laborers were also deported, imprisoned, or shot. The dream of a brave new world had become the nightmare of a police state. As one despairing citizen exclaimed, we all have ropes around our necks. I used to know what communism was. Now, who could know? Though their ruling ideologies were radically different, the ambitions of the dictators of both Germany and the Soviet Union were ruthlessly expansionist. Hitler's were nakedly stated in Mein Kampf, but periodically rejected when diplomacy called for a more pacific approach. Stalin's ambitions were muted by fears of war with Japan and Germany and the economic necessities of world trade. In 1936, both denied coveting any of the territory controlled by other states. The changing map of Europe over the next four years would show how cynical a lie this was. In March 1936, Hitler marched his troops into the demilitarized Rhineland in direct contravention of the Versailles Treaty and the Locarno Pact which he had voluntarily ratified the previous year. It was Hitler's first major territorial aggression. Had France done more than lodge futile protests with the League of Nations, it might well have been his last. Hitler was out on a military and political limb. His troops carried sealed orders to retreat at the first sign of French resistance. When it failed to materialize, Hitler's position within Germany was immeasurably strengthened and his faith in his own political intuition vindicated. Hitler's next bloodless coup occurred in 1938 with the annexation of Austria. A combination of internal agitation from the Austrian Nazi party and the complete outmaneuvering of Chancellor Schuschnigg saw Hitler again defy the guarantors of the Versailles Treaty and drive triumphantly into Vienna. Germany now controlled the Danube Valley and menaced Czechoslovakia from three sides. It was not long before this menace would be transformed into outright aggression. With neither Britain nor France willing to come to the aid of the beleaguered state, Czechoslovakia was forced to cede the Sudetenland to Germany. Hitler declared his expansion in Europe was at an end. Chamberlain, the British Premier, proclaimed that Hitler was a man who could be relied upon when he had given his word. Six months later, German armies occupied Bohemia and Moravia. Belatedly, France and Britain began to realize that their policy of conciliation and appeasement had been interpreted by Hitler as one of vacillation and weakness. In the words of Winston Churchill, they had been weighed in the balance and found wanting. As they attempted to compensate for their earlier blunders by guarantees of military support for those countries still threatened by Hitler, they committed yet another. 
they alienated the Soviet Union. Stalin, at this point, controlled the balance of power in Europe. The Soviet Union proposed that any treaty of mutual assistance between Russia and the Western Allies should also guarantee the sovereignty of all the states from the Baltic to the Black Sea. France and Britain, pressurized by the majority of these states which rejected Russian assistance, rebuffed the proposal. Having ignored the desperate pleas of their strongest ally, Czechoslovakia, they now succumb to the sensibilities of their weaker ones. It was a mistake for which they would pay dearly. In August 1939, as Hitler's rantings against Poland about its treatment of its German minority and its refusal to hand over the free city of Danzig were rapidly growing to a crescendo, the world was shocked by the announcement of a German-Soviet non-aggression pact. Cynically burying their ideological hatchets, fascist Germany and communist Russia agreed to take no military action against each other for the next 10 years. In a secret additional protocol to the pact, they also agreed to divide the independent states of northeastern Europe between them. Having pacified Russia on September the 1st, Hitler sent 50 divisions crashing into Poland, including nine divisions of heavy armor supported by overwhelming air superiority. The 30 divisions of the total Polish army were devastated by the onslaught. The 500 planes of the Polish Air Force were destroyed within days. Despite its pre-war confidence, the Polish military leadership proved poor in the extreme, and some of their tactics, such as charging of tank units by cavalry, bordered on the insane. By the end of the month, a giant pincer movement from the west and the east saw Warsaw crushed within the jaws of its conquerors. After successfully repulsing a Japanese incursion into Mongolia, the Soviet Union was now in a position to implement its part of the secret protocol with Germany. Six Russian armies invaded eastern Poland on the 17th of September. Collapsing under the weight of the struggle in the west, Poland could offer little resistance. The German and Soviet armies appropriately met at Brest-Litovsk, where peace between both nations had been agreed in 1918, and proceeded to redefine their respective spheres of influence. The Soviet Union threatened the Baltic states with invasion unless they allowed Soviet armies to be stationed within their borders. The Balts had little option but to comply. Rigged plebiscites gave a gloss of legitimacy to these occupations. For the loss of only 700 troops, Stalin now controlled eastern Poland and Galicia, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. Stalin's overall strategy was to create a barrier of Russian territory between the Soviet Union and Germany. Snug behind this defensive wall, he planned to allow the Allies and Germany to fight a mutually destructive war in the West. However, the vulnerability of Finland to German invasion and the proximity of the Finnish border to Leningrad still worried him. Stalin demanded that Finland cede him the Karelian Peninsula. When Finland refused, the Red Army attempted an invasion. This was the Soviet Union's first major war, and the debilitating effect of Stalin's purges now became glaringly obvious. Incredibly, no military intelligence assessment of the battlefield was carried out, and the Russian soldiers were ill-prepared for warfare in temperatures as low as minus 50 degrees Celsius. Geoffrey Cox, the British war correspondent viewed the plentiful Russian corpses, 
They all had heelless felt boots, which are wonderfully warm when the snow is dry, hopeless if it is wet. Some had overcoats that were adequately thick, others had only thin coats, and I saw that their padded uniforms were rotten. Few looked adequately clothed for this terrible temperature. The first Soviet assault on the Marnerheim line of fortifications was a fiasco, resulting in easy repulsion and severe losses. Attacks launched on the rump of eastern Finland suffered a similar fate, as the ski-shod mobile units of the Finnish forces inflicted heavy casualties on the snowbound Soviet formations. The Finns waited expectantly for aid from the US and the Western Allies, whose publics had rapturously applauded their gallant resistance. No aid arrived. Instead, on February the 1st of 1940, the Russians massed a force of 54 divisions on the Karelian front. The tiny Finnish army could not withstand such odds, given the ruthless disregard for the lives of their soldiers shown by the Russian commanders. By March the 12th, the Finns were suing for peace. Finland had suffered 58,000 casualties. Nikita Khrushchev, later to succeed Stalin as the tacit dictator of the Soviet Union, reckoned Russian losses close to one million. The Russians annexed not only the Karelian Isthmus, but also a wide swathe of territory to the north of Lake Ladoga. With the takeover of Bukovina and Bessarabia later in the year, the Stalin line had split Eastern Europe in two. But the war of attrition which Stalin had hoped for between the Allies and Germany in the West was slow to materialize. On the 9th of April, in just a single day, Hitler occupied Denmark and the main strategic ports of Norway. This assured him a constant supply of iron ore from neighboring Sweden, as well as the gain of valuable air bases, which could be used against Britain. The Allied response was to mount a joint expeditionary campaign, which did more to damage their own morale than seriously hamper Hitler's operations. While Britain, under the new elected Prime Minister Winston Churchill, was only now preparing to form a wartime coalition cabinet, on the 10th of May, Hitler struck again. German tanks, supported by infantry, swiftly penetrated the thinly fortified borders of Holland and Belgium. Its bombers and parachute regiments destroyed airfields and bridges and blocked road and railways. The ferocious efficiency of this latest Blitzkrieg led to Holland's surrender within five days. In Belgium, French and British forces moved to join the Belgian army to create a line of resistance from the English Channel to the borders of Switzerland. However, German armoured units under General Erwin Rommel exploded the myth that the Ardennes were a barrier to tanks. Rommel's armour broke through a sector of the French line held by second-class reservists north of Sedan. Within two days, it had crossed the Meuse and driven a fatal wedge of 50 miles between the two French armies. The British Expeditionary Force and that half of the French army, which had advanced into Belgium, was now cut off. Within a week, the German push had penetrated 200 miles into French territory, and the roads were awash with refugees. On the 20th of May, the German spearhead reached the English Channel. 
The reaction of one British Air Force officer expressed the general astonishment at German tactics. This is like some ridiculous nightmare. The Germans have taken every risk, criminally foolish risks, and got away with it. The French general staff have been paralyzed by this unorthodox war of movement. The 1914 brains of the French generals are incapable of functioning in this new and astonishing layout. Hitler's war for France was as good as won. The Germans' only mistake came now with their decision to halt and regroup, allowing the encircled British and French forces to retreat to Dunkirk. While the gallant flotilla of small boats ferried the remnants of the Allied Northern armies from Dunkirk across the English Channel to safety, Hitler and his generals debated whether to throw the weight of their armor to the right or left of Paris. On June the 5th, they launched a series of attacks southward from the line of the Somme, supported by a major advance through Alsace. Paris capitulated on the 14th of June. While the worn-out French army continued to offer stubborn resistance, the German advance proved irresistible. At Compiègne on 22nd of June, the French government signed an armistice which amounted to total surrender. Hitler was now undisputed master of Western Europe. The conquest of France had been achieved in a little over six weeks. The world was stunned. While the rapid conclusions of Hitler's previous campaigns were perhaps understandable, this contemptuous dispatch of a major Western power was nothing less than shocking. Stalin's hopes of a protracted war in the West seemed to have evaporated. The failure of the Luftwaffe in the Battle of Britain only made the Soviet position more vulnerable. An invasion of Britain had been postponed indefinitely. It would still be 18 months to two years before Britain herself would be capable of mounting an attack on the mainland of Europe. The German submarine blockade of her shores and the relentless bombing of her war industries might delay such preparations even further. The Western conflict was stalemated. On the 18th of December 1940, Hitler's feral gaze turned firmly towards Russia. The first Barbarossa directive ominously stated that the USSR might be invaded even before the war with Great Britain was over. Though Stalin accepted that war with Germany was now inevitable, he decided Russia had until the spring of 1942 to prepare herself. Even when he received urgent warnings from British and American governments, supported by intelligence from his own agent network that an attack was imminent, Stalin stolidly ignored them. He refused to acknowledge a reality which did not conform to his own preconceptions. His fanatical rejection of unwelcome information was so fierce that vital intelligence concerning German preparations were kept from him by subordinates fearful of the violence of his reaction. As the German build-up toward Operation Barbarossa continued, Stalin went to great lengths to pacify Hitler. He had already stated in an interview with Pravda in November 1939 that it was not Germany who attacked Britain and France, but Britain and France who attacked Germany. Stalin now forbade any criticism of Germany to be printed in the newspapers. He increased Russian supplies to Germany and withdrew recognition of the Norwegian and Belgian governments in exile. When Hitler successfully invaded Greece and Yugoslavia, Stalin expelled the Yugoslavian ambassador to Moscow and refused the request to recognize the Greek government in exile. 
Stalin felt he was continuing to buy time by these unrequited concessions. But his use of the breathing space, which he had already obtained, was far from enterprising. By May 1941, 170 Soviet divisions were stationed in newly occupied territory, with the result that well over half the army were occupying positions whose fortifications and rearward communications were incomplete. Indeed, by June, with a German attack imminent, the Western Special Military District was a shambles. Many formations were between six to 7,000 men short of wartime establishment. Levies of experienced personnel had been hived off to build new tank and aviation units. Only one of six mechanized corps had received their full complement of equipment. Three of the four motorized divisions had no tanks. and four out of every five vehicles in the tank fleets were obsolete. Four corps had only one quarter of their designated motor transport, and in another four corps, one in three motor vehicles needed major repairs. In the Air Force, two of every three aircraft were obsolete. Only one in five crews could fly during daylight under instrument conditions, and there was no centralized air command at front level. Just over half the airfields in the western area held fuel supplies. Communications relied primarily on wire services and the national telephone and telegraph system. Only one in four army and airfield units which should have been equipped with radios actually had them. The major offensive plan for each army was not due until July the 1st, and their defensive strategies were only to be completed by November. The German armies, which the 170 understrength divisions of Russian troops faced, were awesome. Divided into three large army groups, they consisted of 148 fully manned and equipped divisions of which 19 were panzer and 15 panzer grenadier divisions. Army Group South was commanded by Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt and was charged with seizing Kiev and taking control of the Ukraine as far as the river Dnieper. Field Marshal von Bock's Army Group Center was to strike towards Smolensk. Army Group North, under Field Marshal von Leib, was to attack through the Baltics and seize Leningrad. The three German army groups were supplemented by 500,000 Finnish troops advancing from their homeland in 14 divisions and 150,000 Romanians attacking along the Black Sea towards Odessa. These forces fielded 3,350 tanks, over 7,000 artillery pieces, 60,000 motor vehicles, and 625,000 horses. The Luftwaffe devoted 80% of its operational strength, 2,770 aircraft, to the build-up for Barbarossa. Even as 22nd of June approached and the build-up along Soviet borders became so blatant that even Stalin was forced to perceive it, the Russian army still clung to its peacetime structure. Should war occur, then each military district would be transformed into army groupings similar in structure to the Germans. The North Soviet Front was to repel advances through the Balkans and defend Leningrad from Finnish attack. The Northwest 
west and southwest fronts would engage the three main German army groups, and the southern front would deal with any advance towards Odessa. Behind the lines, the contrast between the warring nations could not have been greater. While Germany boasted one of the finest industrial infrastructures in the world, Russia had still not completed its industrial revolution. Stalin had declared in February 1931 that one feature of the history of old Russia was the continual beating she suffered for falling behind, for her backwardness for military backwardness, for cultural backwardness, for industrial backwardness, for agricultural backwardness. We are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries. We must make good this distance in 10 years. Either we do it or they crush us. By 1941, a generation of upheaval had left its mark economically and psychologically. Revolution and civil war had been followed by the destruction of the peasantry and their enforced collectivization into Kholkos. Whole segments of the population had been uprooted and transported to work the new industries set up in the mineral-rich regions of Siberia, the Urals and Kazakhstan. Isolated from the rest of Europe, the narrow strictures of the new culture were still being crudely and enthusiastically imposed on a society in almost constant flux. Through the increased use of informers and the expansion of the NKVD, Stalin had turned the Soviet Union into a dour and frightened police state. The NKVD the People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs administered not only the police, but also many of the new industrial plants in the East. Criminals in the West had to be found to man them. Justice, as excerpts from the Digest of Soviet Justice shows, had become arbitrary and brutal. Sometimes crimes were too great to allow the accused even the privilege of serving the nation in a labor camp. For having used property belonging to the Holkos, without permission, in this case a horse and a boat for fishing, the tribunal applied the decree of August the 7th, 1932, and passed the death sentence. For having thrown a stone at a piglet, and so, prejudicing the safety of the livestock of the Holkos, the tribunal applied the decree of August the 7th, and passed sentence of death. The Russian people, deprived of news of the build-up on their borders and subject to a media devoid of any mention of the increasingly anti-Soviet rhetoric of Hitler, were totally unprepared for the latest disaster which was about to descend upon them. Only the night before the launch of Operation Barbarossa were Soviet armies put on a war alert to man defensive positions. They were still forbidden to respond to any provocation or initiate any action without the direct approval of Moscow. In Germany, society had been transformed by the Nazi rise to power. National Socialism, declared Hitler, is what Marxism could have been, if it could have broken its absurd ties with a democratic order. Why need we trouble to socialize banks and factories? We socialize human beings. Huge public projects such as the building of the autobahn systems helped to erode the chronic unemployment of the early 30s. Centralized direction of the economy plus an upswing in world trade led to a considerable improvement in living standards. <laughs> 
These material improvements were paid for by the intrusion of Nazi culture into every aspect of society. Artists were forbidden to use colors which were not perceived in nature by the normal eye. Religion was transformed into Führer worship. At the 1934 Nuremberg rally, Hitler Youth sang, No evil priest can prevent us from feeling we are the children of Hitler. We follow not Christ, but Horst Wesel. Women had their own battlefield. With each child she brings into the world for the nation, she is fighting her fight on behalf of the nation. The penetration of Hitler's own personality cult into everyday life reached its zenith with the command that all citizens use the German greeting, Heil Hitler, on every occasion that they met. National Socialism projected a vision of Germany as a unified folk community constantly marching towards a glorious and prosperous destiny. But this could only be gained by weeding out the diseased elements of society such as Jews and communists. By 1941, this task was well underway. Auschwitz was established in 1940 and the Warsaw Ghetto sealed off in October 1940. Talks were already afoot to build more Polish concentration camps to deal with the Jews of Germany's allies and the other occupied territories. In the spheres of influence between the two Eastern European protagonists, chaos reigned. In the German-occupied states such as Poland and Slovakia, local economies were ruthlessly subverted to the German war effort. Economic conditions were made deliberately harsh to encourage the flow of migrant labor to Germany. In the Russian-occupied Baltic states, there was a similar economic oppression. However, the encouragement to migrant workers was far less subtle, and one and three-quarter million prisoners were transported eastwards to the labor camps of Siberia. The situation was chronic, but the tribulations of Eastern Europe were only beginning. At 0400 hours on the 22nd of June 1941, the maelstrom, which was Barbarossa, finally erupted. The German armies of the Blitzkrieg sliced through the Russian forces on every front. Faced by the results of his intransigent refusal to act, Stalin panicked. While his army headquarters desperately tried to piece together the most rudimentary picture of what was occurring, he ordered an immediate counteroffensive on all fronts. As the first reports of the devastation his own command had helped to create filtered through, he was shattered. All that Lenin created we have lost forever, he declared. He finally retreated to his dacha, not to emerge until the 3rd of July. While the German panzer division swept all before them, it was the head of the Eastern Orthodox Church, Metropolitan Sergei of Moscow and Kolumna, who filled the breach left by Stalin and addressed the nation in an impassioned plea for resistance. The times of Khan Bati, the German knights, Karl of Sweden and Napoleon are back. Our fathers never lost their hearts even under worse conditions because they thought of their sacred vow and not of personal dangers and profits. Let us live and fight to the glory of our ancestors and their glorious names, since we are kin to them in flesh and blood and belief. Let us remember the holy leaders of the Russian people, Alexander Nevsky, Dmitry Danskoy, who vouchsafed their souls for the sake of the people and the motherland. Let us remember the innumerable thousands of soldiers May their names be glorified. <laughs>
Not only did the Metropolitan Sergei fill the vacuum of leadership at the head of the Russian state, he also presented Stalin with a platform for encouraging the Russian people, which would serve him well throughout the war. While they might be lukewarm about the defense of the Communist Union of Soviet Republics, for the motherland, many would willingly suffer and die. At the front, the rapier thrusts of the German panzer divisions were skewering through the chaotic Russian defenses. The panzer groups created deadly breaches in the Soviet line, slicing the Red Army into isolated segments. The supporting German divisions then moved forward in encircling advances which surrounded these pockets of defenders. The ferocity and effectiveness of the panzer attacks was so great that some of the pockets were gigantic. Groups of up to 15 Russian divisions were surrounded and mercilessly pummeled into surrender. The encirclement of Minsk by the right flank of Army Group North and the left flank of Army Group Center yielded 300,000 prisoners, 2,500 tanks, and 1,400 artillery pieces. 32 of the 43 Russian divisions concentrated in the area between Bialostok and Minsk were gutted within a week, and the road to Moscow penetrated to a depth of 300 kilometers. The remainder of Army Group North scythed into the Baltic, capturing Riga, the Latvian capital. Only in the south were the German forces limited to shallow advances toward Lvov and Rovno. In the skies, the Soviet Air Force was faring even worse than the land army. The mainly obsolete Russian fighters, 20 to 100 miles an hour slower than the Messerschmitt 109s, were constantly outfought. Many of them never got the opportunity of aerial combat. The Luftwaffe claimed to have destroyed almost 1,500 aircraft on the ground during the first day of Barbarossa. On the second, one commander of a Russian bomber group committed suicide after 12 German fighters accounted for 600 of his aircraft. Without radar, without ground control, and often without sufficient fuel, the Russians were driven to desperate tactics, such as using their aircraft to ram German planes. The inventor of this hazardous maneuver, Lieutenant Mikhail P. Zhukov, survived to become an ace with nine kills and five shared victories to his credit. On the ground, chaos reigned. The Luftwaffe were pulverizing the rail and road links behind the Russian lines. Many Russian officers were not even bothering to use code in their desperate pleas for instructions from their headquarters. Struggling masses of uncoordinated troops were being slaughtered by the Germans as they attempted to obey Stalin's orders to counterattack. Others were being machine gunned by their own military police for fleeing from positions which were worse than hopeless. By July the 3rd, the battle for the frontier was over. The German armies had advanced along a line from the river Davina in the north to the Dnieper in the south. General Halder, chief of the German general staff, was declaring that the war against the Soviet Union had taken only 14 days to win. But German intelligence had totally underestimated the reserves which Russia could command. By July the 1st, 5,300,000 men had been mobilized. Stalin emerged from his isolation to broadcast the message of patriotism and resistance to the nation. For once, the Russian people were told the truth. The pre-war complacency which Stalin had done so much to foster had now to be undone. 
In Leningrad, when news of war reached the factories, the general consensus was a Russian victory within a week. Well, it won't necessarily be over in a week, one Russian worker was reported as saying. It will take them three or four weeks to get to Berlin. A grave danger hangs over our country, announced Stalin. The issue is one of life or death for the Soviet state, for the peoples of the USSR. Stalin now took direct control of the Red Army. One of his first moves was to recall those generals who had most conspicuously failed in the field and have them shot. The general mobilization of Russian troops failed to curtail the German advance. Four reserve armies of 37 divisions were dispatched to bolster West Front in the general area of Smolensk. The Germans countered with yet another encirclement, and the panzer groups of General Holt and Guderian smashed through the Soviet line, and 300,000 Russian troops were caught in an indefensible pocket. Another 150,000 prisoners, 2,000 tanks, and 2,000 artillery pieces fell into German hands. Goebbels announced that the eastern continent lies like a limp virgin in the mighty arms of the German Mars. Army Group South finally broke through the Russian southwest front, and another pocket yielded a further toll of 100,000 prisoners. The devastating speed of the German advance was due to the power and tactical brilliance of its panzer divisions. The concept of an integrated armoured force had intrigued the German military since the close of the First World War. By the early 30s, ten prototype tanks had been designed and built in secret. Ironically, the initial development of what would become the most technically accomplished and cost-effective tank programme ever seen took place at the German-Soviet tank school at Hazan in Russia. At the outbreak of the war in the east, the backbone of the Panzer Corps was the Panzer Mark III. Weighing 18 tons, the Mark III carried a crew of five and had a maximum speed of 18 miles an hour. Its armor varied in thickness from 8 to 30 centimeters, and it was armed with a 50 millimeter gun and two machine guns. Backed by the close support Mark IV, Panzer Mark III's would sweep all before them until the Russian T-34 made its appearance in numbers. Russian armoured warfare was inhibited by Stalin's disenchantment with dedicated tank divisions, which had led him in the 30s to utilise his armour only in the support of infantry formations. After witnessing German successes on the Western Front, Stalin changed his mind, but the reorganization of Russian armor was not completed before the launch of Barbarossa. Even though Russian tanks outnumbered German two to one at the front and six to one overall, tactical ineffectiveness, obsolete models and widespread disrepair tipped the advantage overwhelmingly in favor of Germany during the first stages of the conflict. But ground forces were only part of a blitzkrieg operation which saw German advances of up to 50 miles per day. The Panzer Corps were supported by Junkers Stuka. It was at its most fearsome as a dive bomber screeching out of the sky like some furious raptor. Its air brakes allowed it to slow to a speed which enabled its bomb load to be delivered with almost pinpoint accuracy. 
After a month of victorious progress, the German high command were disconcerted by the rapidity of its own advance. German armies were now fighting on a front 1,000 miles wide. The Stukas could no longer deliver the concerted hammer blows which had punched the holes in the Russian lines which the panzers had so mercilessly exploited. Even though the Soviet Air Force had by now lost approximately 5,000 aircraft, the supply of replacements seemed endless. The factories in the east, which were churning out more effective fighter models, were out of Luftwaffe bombing range, while German fighter strength was stretched to the limit. The Luftwaffe also had serious supply problems. The distance from home base and the destruction of the transport infrastructure meant that aircraft replacement parts had to be flown to forward airfields. The lengthening supply lines were also affecting the German ground forces. Tank commanders, hundreds of miles from their Polish depots, nevertheless pressed for the final thrust towards Moscow. They argued that only the continuation of the offensive would prevent the Russians from organizing a fresh line of resistance. While many of Hitler's generals doubted that such an attack should be launched immediately, they were almost unanimous in recommending that Moscow should become the primary objective of the next phase of the war. Hitler, on the other hand, was worried about the possibility of the gaps between the panzer divisions and the main armies being exploited by Russian reinforcements. He also feared that the hundreds of thousands of Soviet troops left behind the German lines in the wake of the advance might coordinate their actions into an effective guerrilla movement. According to the account of one witness to the disarray behind the German advance, he need hardly have worried. Thousands of mobilized men from various places which have already been captured and from near the frontline zone roam from place to place. They lack any purpose, any sense of order. They have no uniforms, 20% are barefoot. The leaders are leaving and they are abandoning us to ruin. Hitler had never been fully convinced of the importance of Moscow and continued to regard it as a secondary objective. The debate stretched out until mid-August. A vital month of summer weather was wasted. The Russians had the breathing space to throw reserve divisions into the gaps in their defenses. Barely trained, poorly equipped, some in the battered remnants of their civilian clothing, their stubborn ferocity meant that they were still a force to be reckoned with. Eventually, the generals were silenced, and two major objectives were set, the capture of Leningrad and the fall of the Ukraine. A giant pincer movement involving half of Army Group Center and the left flank of Army Group South began to close its jaws on a huge pocket of Russian forces to the rear of Kiev. Field Marshal Zhukov, the Soviet Chief of Staff, pleaded with Stalin for a strategic withdrawal of the troops defending the city. He was dismissed from his post. Marshal Budeni of Southwest Front asked Stalin's permission to withdraw. He was relieved of his command. Marshal Timoshenko, the newly appointed Southwest commander, arrived just in time to see the trapped Soviet divisions crumble. The 600,000 prisoners taken by the Germans remained the highest number ever captured in a single engagement. The battle for the Ukraine now centered on the Crimean Peninsula, where the right flank of Army Group South pressed the Soviet 51st Army back towards Sebastopol. While half of the German group center were engaged in subduing the Ukraine, Marshal Zhukov, transferred to the reserve forces behind West Front, seized the opportunity to attack the German Fourth Army. 
Occupying a salient near Smolensk, the Germans were now themselves vulnerable to encirclement. The 4th Army was thrown back 12 kilometers, but without sufficient tanks and aircraft, Zhukov failed to tighten the noose he had fashioned. However, in terms of morale, Zhukov's counterthrust was highly significant. His action was the first substantial Soviet counterattack of the war. Hitler's response was to regroup Army Group Center and prepare the most critical operation of the campaign. Operation Typhoon, the drive toward Moscow, was finally underway. 70 divisions, spearheaded by 1,500 tanks, would race towards the Russian capital before the rains of autumn or the snows of winter could halt their progress. On September the 30th, General Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group almost inevitably broke through the Soviet line and had encircled the defending Bryansk Front by the 6th of October. Simultaneously, Western Front, commanded by Marshal Timoshenko, fell into a similar trap. The pockets of Vyashma and Bryansk, containing nine armies of 71 divisions, were almost completely destroyed. Another 660,000 troops faced the grim hospitality that the German army meted out to prisoners of war, and the road to Moscow lay open. In the Baltic, by the 16th of August, von Leib's Army Group North had captured the city of Novgorod, a vital target in the approach to Leningrad. The beleaguered defenders had fought to the death following the German discovery of the city's defensive plans on the corpse of a Soviet officer. General Herpner's 4th Panzer Group resumed its drive toward Leningrad, but without supporting infantry, its progress was limited. Leningrad was a vital center of the wartime production industry, and reserves and equipment were poured into the defense of the city. The citizens themselves formed Opushenya, militia divisions which were flung against the Germans more in despair than hope. Following a basic training period averaging 16 hours, the 1st Opushenya division was sent to the front six days after being formed. The second, two days, and the third, the same day it was established. Despite such gargantuan efforts, the first shells began to pour down on Leningrad early in September. With the arrival of the 18th Army to reinforce the panzers on the 8th, the German stranglehold on the city tightened further. The capture of Schlüsselburg to the east signaled the end of rail transport. Schlüsselburg was also the terminus of transportation on Lake Ladoga, which networked into the main Russian waterway system. The already starving citizens of Leningrad were now cut off from their meager supply lines. When Marshal Zhukov arrived to take over the defense of the city on the 10th of September, he found the defenders in an advanced state of disorganization and the inhabitants close to panic. Undaunted, he briskly set about bolstering its defenses. A shortage of anti-tank guns was dealt with by converting anti-aircraft artillery to the task of halting the panzers. Six brigades of naval infantry and students were formed, and reinforcements drafted in from the Karelian Isthmus. Zhukov began to take the fight to the Germans through raids and counter-attack, but by now the German troops had pierced the inner circle of defenses and were rampaging through the suburbs. After a furious exchange of advances and retreats, at the end of the month, the defenders were still hanging on to their city by their fingernails. It seemed inevitable that Leningrad would capitulate. But as Zhukov awaited a renewed assault, the 4th Panzer Group suddenly departed to join the battle for Moscow, and the remaining German forces began to build defenses. Leningrad would not now be taken by force, it would be starved into submission. By mid-October, the German invaders controlled all of Western Russia on a line from Leningrad in the north 
to Rostov on the Black Sea, and the Red Army was still retreating before them. The countryside they left behind was a wasteland. The first few months of the war had robbed the nation of nearly 50% of her grain-producing lands. Where the armies had fallen back, vast tracts of crops lay ruined in the fields. The rotting carcasses of livestock slaughtered to deprive the Germans of food mingled their stench with the corpses of soldiers and peasants. Villages tumbled into ruins became the silent memorials of their former inhabitants. The mangled wreckage of sabotaged industries screamed at the skies. Amid the ruins, thousands of starving orphan children searched vainly for their parents. But the fighting spirit of the Russians was far from crushed. It had been inflamed by accounts of the slaughter of prisoners of war and the murder and torture committed by the German invaders. Even the constant series of military reverses failed to dampen the ardor of defenders whose motherland had been ravaged. The roads became nothing but canals of bottomless mud along which our vehicles could advance only at a snail's pace and with great wear to the engines. Wheeled vehicles could advance with the help of tracked vehicles. These, performing tasks for which they were not intended, rapidly wore out. By the 14th of October 1941, the forces of Operation Typhoon had struggled through a week of torrential rains and tenacious Russian resistance to reach the historical battleground of Brodino. They were now just 100 kilometers from their ultimate goal, the capture of Moscow. Advancing painfully through the quagmire of the Russian autumn, the tired Germans began to face a quality of Soviet unit they had not previously encountered. The crack division of 32nd Rifles had been transferred to the defense of Moscow from the eastern outreaches of Siberia. Containing two tank brigades armed with the revolutionary T-34 tank and fully supported by anti-tank and anti-aircraft weapons, the Siberians initially provided an effective windbreak to the diminishing fury of Operation Typhoon. But five days later, the sheer weight of the German advance had overwhelmed them. In the nerve center of the Soviet Union, the proximity of the German armies threw the inhabitants into total disarray. Mass evacuations were organized while some citizens simply fled of their own accord. Even Stalin and his government prepared to abandon their capital. In one of the most dramatic incidents of the war, Stalin left his waiting train and after pacing manically up and down the station platform, decided that the government would remain. A state of siege was declared, and a decree of the 19th of October stated that all provocateurs, all spies and other agents of the enemy are to be shot on the spot. The remaining citizens of Moscow were scoured for recruits to a civil reserve force, which was hastily mobilized to the front. Stalin now learned from his spies in Japan that the Japanese government did not intend to attack in the east. Freed of the nightmare of war on a second front, he ordered the transport of 22 fresh divisions of well-equipped Siberian forces to Moscow. But time was running out. By the first week of November, the Germans had advanced another 20 kilometers. Tanks and vehicles were still being sucked into roadways no better than swamp tracks. The Germans prayed for the frosts to come to harden them. When the freeze finally arrived, they wished their prayers had been ignored. The November frosts came late but sharp. General Guderian had earlier requested winter supplies, but had been rebuked for negative thinking. The Germans began to find a concrete use for the propaganda leaflets they had been issued with, stuffing them into their uniforms to keep the cold at bay. <laughs> 
In Moscow, Stalin struggled to kindle the flame of citizen morale by staging the traditional Revolution Day parade, despite the dangers of aerial bombardment. In his speech at Lenin's tomb, he again appealed to the ancient Russian tradition of heroism in the face of adversity. The war you are waging is a war of liberation, a just war. May you be inspired in this war by the heroic figures of our great ancestors. While the remaining inhabitants greeted this speech with muted enthusiasm, the Germans crept closer. Hitler had insisted that his armies should divide and approach Moscow from the north and south simultaneously. By the end of November, they were only 30 kilometers from their target. The spires of the Kremlin were tantalizingly within their gaze, but Hitler's arrogance in failing to provide winter supplies was now disastrously limiting their progress. Without antifreeze, motor vehicles would not start and planes could not fly. Without winter clothing, frostbite claimed the limbs of tens of thousands of the advancing army. Guns refused to fire, food refused to thaw. When it did, soup froze on the spoon. Guderian later wrote of the endless expanse of Russian snow during this winter of our misery the icy wind that blew across it, the shelters too thin, badly clothed, half-starved men. The campaign medal later awarded to the veterans of the Russian winter came to be known as the Order of the Frozen Flesh. On the 5th of December, the harrying of the still advancing German forces by night raids and daytime sorties became a concerted counterattack. For those consistently retreating before the German armies, it was difficult to orientate themselves towards this sudden offensive. We had thought first we will halt the enemy, marshal our reserves, prepare for attack, and finally throw ourselves upon them. The reality turned out harsher and more exacting. We simply had to turn our left shoulder around and attack the enemy under whose pressure we had been retreating until yesterday. In a final assault which had begun on the 1st of December, the Germans came as close as 15 kilometers to Moscow. Zhukov's Western Front then began to drive back the northern arm of their encirclement. and Southern Front halted Guderian's forces around Tula to the south. Mobile groups of Russians destroyed fuel dumps and artillery deep behind the German lines. The troops of the Third Reich now faced fully equipped Russian infantry, snugly clad in their felt boots and greatcoats. Harried by ski battalions, they watched their enemy's T-34 tanks crash through snow and woodland while their own panzers sluggishly negotiated the roadways. German morale wilted. The hard-pressed soldiers, most of them still clad in their summer uniforms and tight leather boots, fell back rapidly, often abandoning huge caches of equipment in their haste. Encouraged by their breakthrough, the Russian high command attempted to turn the German tactics on themselves and encircle their entire army group center. Despite Hitler's orders to stand firm, by the end of the year, the Germans had withdrawn up to 150 kilometers from Moscow. Generals Guderian and Herpner had been dismissed for retreating without permission. Von Blumenritt, commander of the Fourth Army, described how the German situation might have been even worse. I and my staff spent Christmas Day in a small hut, with Tommy guns on the table. 
and the sound of shooting all around us. Just as it seemed that nothing could save us from being cut off, we found that the Russians were moving on westwards, instead of turning up north astride our rear. The Russian counterattack was further strengthened by the reinstatement of officers condemned to the prison camps during Stalin's great purges. They were ferocious warriors. As the wounded commander of the 222nd Rifles told his German interrogators, if a man has a penal camp behind him, death holds no terror for him. Less distinguished prisoners were released into penal battalions which performed the most dangerous tasks, such as clearing minefields and storming strong points. The casualty rate in these battalions was the highest in the Red Army, but prisoners still volunteered for military service. The death rate in the camps had increased sevenfold since 1940. In the south, German progress was also being stymied. Timoshenko massed 22 divisions of the Red Army against the 1st Panzer Group, which had captured Rostov, the communication center of the Dnieper Basin. Cut off from the potential reinforcement of the 17th Army to the north, the 1st Panzer Group were forced to fall back more than 70 kilometers. Hitler sacked von Rundstedt, commander of Army Group South, and ordered an immediate halt to the retreat. Only when he had reviewed the position at first hand did Hitler accept that withdrawal had been the only possible option. At Leningrad, food supplies to the besieged city had been worsening throughout the autumn. By late November, they were at their lowest ebb of the whole siege. Manual workers were receiving only 250 grams of bread per day, one third of their normal requirement. Without water for sanitation and basic medical supplies, disease became rampant. As temperatures fell to the minus 20s, thousands began to die each day. Total starvation threatened constantly. To the Germans, collapse seemed imminent. Back in Berlin, a reception with Adolf Hitler as guest of honor was organized to celebrate the fall of the stricken city. The invitations were printed, but never posted. The Russians marked a road across the frozen southwest corner of Lake Ladoga, and by the 22nd of November, convoys of lorries were barely staving off famine in the city. It was a hazardous passage through the biting northeastern gales which swept across the lake. Alexander Meshirov, the poet, vividly remembered the journey across the frozen wasteland. What a road. A nightmare horror, that road. Of all my roads, the worst. What a road. Running into the thick of the blockade with only the sky above. Yet for all its horror, the Russians knew that defending this lifeline to the city was the only possibility of keeping the inhabitants alive. I'll never need to be urged to attack, whether the fire falls heavy or no. Ladoga's ice in my eyes looms black, with Leningrad children dead in the snow. But the food coming across the ice was too little, too late for some. Victims of starvation, suffering from falling blood pressure and the wasting of the heart and internal organs, would never regain their health. 
many would die months after food and medical supplies finally arrived. The children who survived would emerge totally traumatized by the siege. It was reflected in the way many of the children played all by themselves, in the way that even in their collective games they played in silence with grave faces. I saw faces of children which reflected such thoughtfulness and sorrow that those eyes and faces told one more than could be gathered from all the stories of the horrors of famine. It wasn't until the Red Army retook Tikhovin on December the 9th, opening a rail link with the city, that the situation in Leningrad eased. In the far north, Hitler's attentions had been fixed on closing the all-weather port of Murmansk, through which Russia could be supplied by naval convoys from Britain. Winter conditions around Moscow were balmy compared to those of the primordial terrain surrounding Murmansk. General Dietl, commander of Mountain Corps Norway, informed Hitler that the landscape up there in the tundra outside Murmansk is just as it was after the creation. There's not a tree, not a shrub, no human settlement, no roads and no paths. In the summer, it's a swamp. In the winter, there's ice, snow, and it's 40 to 50 degrees below. Icy gales rage throughout the eight months of the Arctic night. By the end of 1941, the Germans had made virtually no progress. The port of Murmansk was still open and communications with central Russia still intact. As the new year approached, there was every reason for Stalin to feel optimistic about the outcome of the war. The German Blitzkrieg had slowed to a crawl, halted and was now grinding into reverse. It also seemed that the great exodus of industry to the east had been successfully accomplished. While the next three months would prove critical, the economic war had been put on a sound footing. The eastern industrial enclaves rapidly became the cornerstone of the Russian war effort. The instant expansion of the Ural, Siberian and Kazakhstan centers of production in the first year of the war was nothing short of miraculous. 360 large enterprises, mainly war enterprises, were evacuated to the eastern regions of the USSR. On land, the T-34 tank was now becoming standard, to the dismay of the German panzer groups. When the first of these medium tanks was met by the 17th panzers, they found that their shells simply bounced off its heavy sloped armor, while its high-velocity 76mm turret gun proved devastating. It plowed through the advancing Germans for nine miles before being halted by a field artillery howitzer at short range. The T-34 was the most successful tank design of the entire war. Its powerful diesel engine enabled it to sail over terrain that the panzers balked at. The T-34 seemed capable of constant modification and improvement. The barrel of its 76mm gun was lengthened to strengthen its armour-piercing capability. Later, its firepower was further increased by arming a larger turret with an 85mm gun adapted from anti-aircraft usage. The T-34's armour was also upgraded to 110mm on the front and 90mm around the turret. Over 40,000 T-34s would be produced before the war was over. But despite Soviet optimism, the war was far from nearing its end. The Russian defenders had paid a terrible price for their resistance, and the toll in human terms would continue for the next three years. <laughs> 
The Soviet casualties in the first six months of the invasion had been staggering. It was only 50 years later that it would be admitted that one and a half million troops had perished in the defense of Moscow alone. Many of those who were taken prisoner by the Germans fared worse than the dead. The German high command alleged that the Russians had refused to abide by the Geneva Convention on the treatment of prisoners of war and encouraged German troops to seek revenge on such barbarous subhumans. The Soviet Union had in fact undertaken to observe the Geneva Protocols and through neutral Sweden had requested that Germany do the same. Germany's response was to shoot Russian prisoners out of hand, to gas them, starve them, and deprive them of the medical supplies necessary for their survival. Many were crammed into rail carts and left in sidings to perish. Others were force marched until they died from exhaustion. More were simply exposed to the deadly cruelties of the Russian winter. Hundreds of thousands of Soviet prisoners had been murdered by 1942, and this was to set an horrendous trend which would continue throughout the course of the war. Even some of the German soldiers, like Guy Sayer, were sickened by the treatment of Russian prisoners. In the autumn of 1942, a locomotive appeared in the distance. It was entirely blacked out. What I saw next froze me with horror. The first of the flat cars to pass my uncomprehending eyes seemed to be carrying a confused heap of objects which only gradually became recognizable as human bodies. Directly behind this heap, other people were clinging together, crouching or standing. Howls looked at me. Except for the burning red spots made by the cold, his face was as white as a sheet. Did you see that? he whispered. They've piled up their dead to shield themselves from the wind. Every car was carrying a shield of human bodies. I stood as if petrified by the horror of the sight rolling slowly by faces entirely drained of blood and bare feet stiffened by the cold. The total number of Russian prisoners to be captured would eventually be reckoned at five and a half million. Of these, only two million would survive the inhuman treatment of their captors. Of the rest, Many would be murdered during the first few weeks of their captivity, while two million would perish in the notorious concentration camps of the Reich. Hermann Goering told Ciano, Mussolini's envoy, that Russian prisoners, having been forced to eat the soles of their boots, had then resorted to cannibalism and, which is more serious, had also eaten a German sentry. Some nations must be decimated. There is nothing to be done about it. The paltry figure of three and a half million slaughtered Russian POWs was a drop in the ocean for Reichsfuhrer SS Heinrich Himmler. Himmler's plans for the new order in Europe envisaged the reduction of its Slav population by at least 30 million. It was Himmler and his deputy Heydrich who were the real masters of occupied Russia. Field Marshal Keitel, when asked why the supposedly civilized commanders of the German army allowed the barbarities of the Russian invasion to occur, protested that even the commander-in-chief of the army did not have the executive power or authority to issue and enforce laws in the occupied East. This prerogative belonged strictly to Heydrich and Himmler, 
who had de facto discretionary powers over the life and death of population and prisoners, including prisoners of war. Yet there is abundant evidence of German field commanders only too willing to aid and abet the murderous pogroms of the SS. Himmler's sinister men in black, the Schutzstaffel, or SS, became the supreme rulers of Western Russia. Even before Barbarossa, the SS had discussed with the army officers how they could be facilitated in the campaign of terror they were to unleash in the wake of the invasion. In May 1941, four Einsatzgruppen were formed with the primary aim of eliminating the ideological opponents of the Reich. Soviet officials, commissars and Jews were to be rounded up and shot to death. In the event, those who were dispatched swiftly by a bullet were the fortunate. Local Jewish leaders in Russia were forced to assemble their people in designated areas. From these collection points, they were transported to killing fields, where they were stripped of their clothing and riddled with machine gun fire. The sheer numbers involved often meant that the wounded were also tipped into the burial pits and covered up to suffocate. At Kiev, in September 1941, over 33,000 Jews were murdered in a single operation, which lasted two days. In Pinsk, the carnage was accomplished with the use of grenades, dogs, axes, and the cavalry of the SS. It was difficult, demanding work, and soldiers were rewarded with treble pay and long holidays. Erik Ohlendorf, one of the Einsatzgruppen commanders boasted that he had personally disposed of 90,000 victims, mainly Jews, in the first year of the war. But it was not only Jews who suffered. Anyone could be accused of being an official or a commissar and summarily executed. German troops were actively encouraged to commit outrage on an occupied population which was to be subjugated by terror. People were brutalized for real or imagined offenses. Despite regulations, women were raped in the streets in full view of horrified onlookers. As well as carrying out this policy of repression and ethnic sanitation, Officials in Russia were also obliged to provide forced labor for the German war economy. This allowed male civilians in the Reich to be freed for military service. The German officials in Russia went about the task with an eerie mixture of barbarity and incompetence. Potential recruits were gathered without any discrimination as to their suitability. They were often left unfed for long periods, and conditions on the westbound freight trains which carried them were insanitary and inhuman. Babies born on the journey were ripped out of their mother's arms and flung onto passing embankments to perish. Not surprisingly, by the end of 1941, 100,000 of those transported from the Ukraine were sent back as unfit to work. Many did not survive the return journey. Those waiting to travel westwards were forced to watch dead comrades being unloaded from the trains they themselves would have to occupy. This treatment of occupied peoples, some of which had welcomed the Nazis as saviors from the tyranny of Stalin, eventually gave rise to resistance movements determined to exact revenge for the brutalities which had been inflicted on them. The atrocities were etched deep into the psyches of those who witnessed them and inspired an implacable hatred for the perpetrators. You will not hear the mother calling from 7,003 kilometers away through the menacing howl of the polar wind in the crush of disasters that surround you. <laughs> 
You, my dear, are becoming a wild beast there. You, the last and the first, you are ours. Dispassionate spring wanders over my Leningrad grave. You will hoist me onto a bloody hook like a slain beast, so that foreigners giggling with disbelief should wander around and write in learned journals that my incomparable gift had died, that I was a poet of poets, but that thirteen o'clock struck for me. On the 5th of January, 1942, Stalin ordered a general offensive utilizing nine of the Soviet Union's ten front groups. Zhukov's forces were to continue the counterattack in the center. The Crimea was to be retaken. Leningrad was to be freed from the clutches of Army Group North, and the Donetsk Basin was to be recovered from Army Group South. Hitler had now taken over active command of the German armies on the Eastern Front. His priorities gave little confidence to his harassed generals. Anyone can do the little job of directing operations in war. The task of the commander-in-chief is to educate the army to be national socialist. I do not know any general who can do this as I want it done. I have therefore decided to take over the command of the army myself. In addition, Hitler was losing faith in the commanders who had failed to bring Barbarossa to a successful conclusion. He had already dismissed both the cautious von Wunstedt and the audacious Guderian. The friction between Hitler and his generals became vocal and more rancorous as the winter wore on. Despite this, as the January initiative became bogged down in the spring thaw, Stalin had little to show for an offensive which was so ruthlessly driven that it produced more Russian than German casualties. The Volkov Front managed to penetrate von Leib's army group north, but its second shock army were isolated at the spearhead of the penetration and the attack was repulsed. Further south, Northwest Front encircled 90,000 men of von Leib's army in an 800-mile area near Demyansk. However, in a heroic operation, which won the personal praise of the Führer, the Luftwaffe managed to stave off a withdrawal by providing the Demyansk pocket with 270 tons of supplies each day, until eventually a corridor was pushed through to relieve the defenders. The 29th Army of the Kalinin Front, which had almost completed an encirclement of a large portion of Army Group Center, was itself surrounded and destroyed. Army Group South managed to contain the bulge that was developing under attack from the Russian South and Southwest Fronts. In the Crimea, Russian gains were restricted to the Kersh Peninsula. It had been the most brutal winter in living memory, and both sides emerged exhausted. Army General Merit Skoll wrote, I will never forget the endless forests, the bogs, the waterlogged peat fields, the potholed roads, the punishing battle with the forces of the enemy that went on side by side with the equally punishing battle with the forces of nature. The German armies emerged from the winter fighting in a state described by General Franz Halder, Hitler's chief of staff, as disastrous. Of the 162 divisions facing the Red Army, only 11 were fully capable of offensive operations. For the 16 panzer divisions in the east, only 140 serviceable tanks were available, and most divisions were only 20% mobile. 
Nevertheless, Hitler was determined that a full-scale attack should be resumed. It was a question of advance or retreat. Halder even considered recommending a withdrawal to the pre-war border in Poland. Quite wisely, he never mentioned this to Hitler. If the German armies stepped back, then Russia could regroup her forces, recover her raw materials, and rebuild her Western industries. Hitler had been informed by the economic lobby in Germany that without fresh oil reserves, it could not sustain the war effort. The oil fields of the Caucasus beckoned temptingly. All thoughts of withdrawal were pushed aside. The losses of manpower, vehicles and tanks, which had been suffered since the outbreak of hostilities, could not be fully made good for the new offensive. Infantry divisions were now to total seven battalions instead of nine. The battle strength of companies was reduced from 180 troops to 80. Between November 1941 and March 1942, only 7,500 vehicles were supplied to replace the 75,000 which had been lost, and fuel oil was in short supply. Mobility had been seriously affected. The panzer divisions, which would take part in the summer offensive in the south, contained barely 135 tanks each. Even this had only been achieved by seriously weakening northern and central divisions. The one weapon that Hitler did have on his side was surprise. Stalin had assumed that Hitler would resume his attack on Moscow and heavily reinforced its defensive reserves. But when the Germans struck on the 8th of May, it was the Crimean front which was torn apart by von Manstein's 11th army. The German strategy was to clear its flanks for a concerted drive towards the oil fields of the Caucasus. While von Manstein subdued the Crimea, Timoshenko's southwest front, which lay on the northern flank of the drive, was to be destroyed by the 9th and 57th armies. Ironically, as the Germans prepared to attack Timoshenko, he was busily gathering reinforcements for an offensive which would retake Kharkov. On the 12th of May, with 600,000 men, he launched this operation westwards. Penetration against the German 16th Army was deep and swift, but as the Russian lines of communication lengthened, their flanks became increasingly vulnerable. On the 17th of May, a German attack pierced the armies of the Southern Front, which was protecting the left flank of the Russian offensive. As Timoshenko turned to respond to this threat, the 16th Army counterattacked his wheeling force on its right flank. When the German encirclement was completed, almost the total reserve of T-34 and KV-1 tanks built up over the winter months was in German hands, along with over 2,000 guns and almost 250,000 prisoners. In the south, von Manstein had by now entered the final phase of his Crimean campaign, and only the fortress of Sevastopol, besieged since the previous year, was under Soviet control. After 250 days of dogged resistance, Sevastopol finally capitulated on the 4th of July. The victorious von Manstein and his troops were ordered north to Leningrad, despite pleas to cross the Kersh Strait and bolster the main offensive.
The German forces were now organized into two groups. Army Group B struck eastwards from Kursk to the north and Kharkov to the south, but failed to encircle the retreating Soviet forces. Hitler, convinced that the main body of the Red Army had retreated to the area north of Rostov, ordered a huge encirclement of the city. In doing so, he pulled the 4th Panzer Army away from its advance down the Donetsk corridor towards Stalingrad. It was a fatal mistake. Von Kleist was to write later, the 4th Panzer Army was advancing on my left. It could have taken Stalingrad without a fight at the end of July, but was diverted south to help me in crossing the Don. I did not need its aid. It merely congested the roads I was using. When it turned north again, a fortnight later, the Russians had gathered just sufficient forces at Stalingrad to check it. After taking Rostov, Army Group A continued along the Black Sea towards the foothills of the Caucasus. Hitler had planned to take Stalingrad and then proceed southwards. He was now committed to achieving both objectives simultaneously. By late August, Army Group A was running into stiff resistance from the newly formed Trans-Caucasus Front, defending the span of the huge mountain chain from the Black Sea to the Caspian. A Russian southeast front was also established to protect the plains to the northeast of the mountains. The Caucasus front contained Georgians, Armenians and Azarians, who were well aware of what a German invasion would mean for themselves and their families. Their resistance was desperate and determined. Approximately half the adult males of Georgia would eventually sacrifice themselves in the bitter struggle for their homeland. Not only was resistance hardening in front of Army Group A, but their strength was constantly being eroded to bolster the battle for Stalingrad to the north. The Caucasian oil wells had been the primary target of the German summer offensive. The taking of Stalingrad was at first simply an obvious target to protect the left flank of Army Group A. Had Stalingrad not been named in honor of the Russian leader, it might have remained a subsidiary target. Hitler began to find the symbolism of its name increasingly difficult to resist. On the 23rd of July, its capture was placed on a par with the sudden advance. By September, defeat at the city named after his arch rival was unthinkable. Stalin too was aware of the symbolic significance involved. As early as the 1st of July, with the German 6th Army approaching the big bend of the Don and threatening the road to the city, Stalin told Timoshenko, I order the formation of an army group Stalingrad. The city itself will be defended by the 62nd Army to the last man. At the time of Stalin's order, the 62nd Army were desperately preparing a defensive position at the Clutch Bridgehead west of the Don, supported to the south by the 64th Army and 1st Tank Army. On the 30th of July, the German 6th Army struck north and south of this formation, and by the 8th of August, it was encircled. The remnants of the 62nd and 64th Army pulled back to form a defensive perimeter around Stalingrad, leaving the approach road virtually undefended. On the 23rd of August, the 6th Army, under General Friedrich Paulus, and the 4th Panzer Army crossed the Don and sped toward the city. Despite the resolute defense of the outnumbered Soviet forces, the Germans crashed through the suburbs. Only a rapid withdrawal to the inner city on the 30th of August prevented a complete encirclement of the forward defenses. The depleted Russian ranks were bolstered by the addition of 125,000 adult citizens and 7,000 male youths between the ages of 13 and 17. 
Workers in the munitions factories handed over weapons and equipment to their soldiers as soon as they came off the production lines. As the battle grew in intensity, they were forced to use them themselves. In their eagerness for a rapid victory, the Germans made a severe tactical error. While the firebombing of the Luftwaffe, which was ordered as a prelude to the final assault, created major structural damage, it also constricted the mobility of the attackers. It turned the struggle for occupation into a Rattenkrieg, a rat's war through the rubble-choked thoroughfares of the city. German tank superiority and aerial dominance counted for very little. The German army's whole tactical training had been concerned with how to avoid such a war of vicious attrition. The defenders, on the other hand, proved adept at this hide-and-seek struggle through the labyrinth of ruined buildings and blocked alleyways to which Stalingrad was reduced. The battle zones contracted to minuscule proportions. In the larger buildings, floors and even stairways were transformed into centers of conflict. Any overview became almost impossible as individual buildings changed hands several times in a single day. Back in Germany, the slow progress of its army gave rise to jokes parodying the official reports from the front. Today, our troops captured a two-room flat with kitchen, toilet and bathroom. They managed to retain two-thirds of it despite hard-fought counterattacks from the enemy. Nevertheless, the sheer weight of the German attack began to tell. By mid-September, the defense of the city seemed on the point of being overwhelmed. The result of the war in the East hung once again in the balance. Hitler was disregarding the tactics of Vernichtungsgedanke, the idea of annihilation by swift blows to the flanks and rear, which had been the basis of all German successes to date. He was disregarding the needs of the campaign in the Caucasus by diverting crucial amounts of manpower to Stalingrad. And, totally out of character, he was ignoring the weakness of the German flanks along the 60-mile salient which the attack on Stalingrad had created. Hitler was risking everything in his growing obsession with this one city. The Red Army, pressed back against the Volga with the smoking ruins of Stalingrad in front of them, were once again on the rack. The optimism of the early spring had turned sour in a soul-destroying series of defeats which saw further huge tracts of their homeland fall into enemy hands. Should Stalingrad now capitulate, the blow to their morale would be immense. More ominously, the fall of Stalingrad would seal the fate of the Caucasus and pave the way for the final breach of the only barrier to stand between Nazi Germany an absolute control of the European continent. For all the excesses and brutalities of Stalin's Russia, Stalingrad's collapse would unleash an era of cold-blooded slaughter and mayhem such as the world had never before witnessed. In the words of Joseph Goebbels, a time of brutality approaches of which we ourselves have absolutely no conception. In fact, we are in the middle of it. We shall only reach our goal if we have enough courage to destroy, laughingly to shatter what we once held holy, such as tradition, upbringing, friendship and human love. The battle for Stalingrad, which raged from the end of August 1942, was one of the most bitter engagements in a war notorious for its savage ferocity. It also marked the point where Hitler's growing disenchantment with his generals degenerated into almost total hostility. Hitler's military successes 
from the occupation of the Rhineland to the fall of France, had all been achieved against the strident opposition of the majority of his senior army commanders. While Hitler's impatience with their defeatism and lack of faith in his expansionist strategies mounted, their dissatisfaction with his military adventurism turned close to mutiny. Following the invasion of Poland, when Hitler's plans for the campaign in the West were being formulated, army chiefs of staff considered his intentions so disastrous that they actively conspired to assassinate him. Halder, chief of general staff, carried a pistol during his visits to Hitler in the Reichstag, hoping for a favorable opportunity to end his irresponsibility before it ruined the German nation. Eventually, he decided that, as a human being and a Christian, he could not shoot down an unarmed man. As plans for the Western offensive began to appear more realistic, the crisis passed. Despite the overwhelming success of the campaign in the West, the distrust which had festered between Hitler and his generals was suppressed rather than eliminated. During the Polish campaign, Hitler had been content to make suggestions and recommendations. During the war with France, he had begun to exercise control over operational objectives. By 1941, he could turn the army's invasion plan for Russia on its head by refusing to prioritize the capture of Moscow, which was central to its strategy. At the end of 1941, Hitler stated that, the senior officers who have risen from the general staff are incapable of standing severe strain and major tests of character. During the 1942 summer offensive, Admiral Speer recalled blunt statements that the generals were without honor, without intelligence, that they were liars, that he was dealing with a bunch of crooks, were often made by Hitler in the presence of numerous army officers. He could not be moved to adopt a more conciliatory tone. Instead, he became even more offensive. In the Soviet Union, Stalin had traveled in a diametrically opposite direction to Hitler. The irrational barbarity of the pre-war purges of Red Army officers had been chillingly exposed by the total inability of the Russian defenders to contain the initial onslaught of Operation Barbarossa. Stalin's hysterical execution of the generals he blamed for this catastrophe and his own frantic orders to counterattack amid the chaos at the front did little to foster a constructive relationship with his commanding officers. Nevertheless, as the first storm was weathered and the Red Army finally showed itself capable of inflicting reverses on the Germans, Stalin's attitude softened. While he continued to exercise a sometimes alarming degree of control over the direction of the Soviet war effort, he turned increasingly to the administrative and political tasks which were where his considerable talents could find their most effective outlet. Stalin's grasp of the economic and political realities of warfare was in sharp contrast to Hitler's fitful excursions into these areas. But it was the Fuhrer's tactical ineptitude which was now dramatically exposed. For five months at Stalingrad, the Russian and German troops played a deadly game of cat and mouse amongst the ruins of what had once been a thriving industrial metropolis. 
From the dank cellars beneath the ruined city to the wind-whipped rooftops of the factories, soldiers fought and died to gain control of buildings, street corners, and even sections of crumbling brickwork. As the BBC reported on October the 11th, this is not a battle for a locality or a river, but for street crossings and houses. Poland was conquered in 28 days. In 28 days in Stalingrad, the Germans took several houses. France was defeated in 38 days. In Stalingrad, it took the Germans 38 days to advance from one side of the street to the other. The individual acts of heroic resistance by Russian troops became legendary. When the fighting was at its heaviest, a communications wire was hit and telephone communications broken off. Private Kittain was ordered to find the fault and mend it. He crawled under heavy fire until he found the place where the wire had been torn by a shell fragment. At that moment, he was mortally wounded but he found the strength to connect the wire with his teeth. And so he died, clenching the wires. The communications link was re-established. While their stomachs might be contracting from starvation, the Russian troops at Stalingrad nurtured their spirits with music and song. In a dugout expressed the almost intolerable loneliness of those far from their loved ones, but constantly close to death. In our dugout, a log fires a flame, weeping resin, it sputters and sighs. The accordion's tender refrain sings of you and your smile and your eyes. We are now many light years apart and divided by snow-covered steps, though the road to your side is so hard, to death's door it's an easy four steps. Despite grinding resistance, by October, the Germans occupied seven-eighths of the city. The Russian 62nd Army, under its newly appointed commander, General V. I. Chukov, was penned back against the Volga River. However, battered ferries from the east bank, running a gauntlet of bombs and artillery fire, kept the encircled defenders supplied with food and munitions. In the third week of October, it seemed as if the Russians would be overrun. Only the inspirational leadership of Zhukov, rallying his forces from the thick of the action, and the Red Army's capacity to regain under cover of darkness the strong points they had lost by day, prevented the fall of the city. During the first half of November, the Volga was blocked by ice. Without the ferries, the Russian position became almost intolerable. In the air, while the Luftwaffe now flew only half the number of sorties it had managed at the outbreak of the battle, this was still twice what the Red Air Force could achieve. Again, the German army came within a whisker of overpowering the Russian defences. The final attack was planned for November the 18th. But behind the Russian lines, preparations were already underway for a counter-offensive which would doom the 6th Army's efforts and spell the collapse of the whole German campaign in the south. As early as August, the German High Command had warned Hitler of the dangers of advancing Army Group A into the Caucasus, while simultaneously using Army Group B to attempt the capture of Stalingrad. German military resources were totally inadequate to safeguard the flanks of this double spearhead. A gap soon developed between groups A and B, which was 200 miles wide and guarded by just a single division. Not only did Hitler ignore the warnings of his generals, which grew more raucous as the campaign developed, 
but he continuously weakened the flanks of the two groups by siphoning off forces to feed his ongoing obsession with Stalingrad. As von Manstein wrote later, To leave the main body of the army group at Stalingrad for weeks on end was a cardinal error. It amounted to nothing less than presenting the enemy with the initiative, and it was a clear invitation for him to surround the 6th Army. By the 19th of November, the Soviet counterattack routed the Romanian troops to the north of Stalingrad. While 100 miles to the south, the Red Army overran a mixed German and Romanian force. On November the 22nd, the two Russian armies met and Stalingrad was encircled. Von Paulus, the inexperienced commander of the 6th Army, requested that he be allowed to reform his troops and withdraw. During those first days of the encirclement, the 6th Army had barely six days' rations of food and ammunition for only two days. Many of its artillery batteries were completely out of shells. On the 26th, Hitler delivered a personal message to the beleaguered troops of Stalingrad, ordering them to stand fast and promising to do all in his power to support them. The problem of supplies was turned over to the Luftwaffe, which had so valiantly supplied the pocket at Demyansk the previous spring. Goering, its commander, was summoned before Hitler and agreed to guarantee 550 tons of supplies per day. Despite the skepticism of the army chiefs of staff, the airlift began on the 25th of November. The results of the first days of the operation were ominous for the troops still fighting the rats' war amongst the cellars and ruins of the city. Only 65 tons were delivered on day one. The same quantities arrived on day two. On the third day, no supplies whatsoever reached the desperate German forces. The Luftwaffe had no safe landing grounds in the vicinity of the 6th Army. As the German perimeter of control around the city shrank under Russian pressure, this situation consistently deteriorated. Thick fogs made flying hazardous, if not impossible. Freezing temperatures meant that aircraft servicing became a torturous task for the German mechanics. Added to this, the Red Air Force was increasing its sorties and the tactics of its pilots were sharpening as the conflict wore on. The airlift proved a fiasco, and the German troops began to starve. However, the airlift was only part of Hitler's strategy to relieve the situation in Stalingrad. Von Manstein was ordered to form a relief force to be known as Army Group Don. Its immediate objective was to bring the enemy attacks to a standstill and recapture the positions previously occupied. Von Manstein's strategy involved an attack by Army Group Don towards Stalingrad and a breakout westwards by part of the 6th Army. When both assault forces met, they would provide a corridor through which the remnants of the 6th Army still engaged in Stalingrad could be withdrawn. 
Von Manstein's problems began even before his forces could attack the Russians. The reinforcements which would give Army Group Don its only hope against vastly superior Russian numbers failed to arrive. Worse, the Russian strength in the area was increasing. The 4th Panzer Army was forced to launch the offensive alone. Against all the odds, by the 17th of December, von Manstein had reached a position only 35 miles short of Stalingrad, forcing sections of the Red Army surrounding the city to break away from the siege to block the advance. By the 19th, the relief force had gained another five miles and was just 30 miles from making contact with the 6th Army. Von Manstein urgently requested Hitler to allow the 6th Army to retreat towards him and bring the Russians under fire from east and west. Once the two German forces met, then the 3,000 tons of supplies assembled behind the 4th Panzer Army could be pushed through to those retreating from the city. Faced with silence from Führer headquarters, von Manstein himself gave the order for the breakout to begin. It would be a desperate gamble for the 6th Army. Only a hundred of its tanks remained operational, and these held sufficient fuel for a journey of 20 miles or less. The physical ability of von Paulus's half-starved troops to mount any sort of mobile campaign was also questionable. Faced with these risks, and in possession of previous orders from Hitler to stand firm, Von Paulus disobeyed the direct order of von Manstein, his superior officer. In doing so, he doomed the majority of the quarter of a million soldiers under his command to a slow and painful death. Events to the north and the south of the city now began to draw attention away from the fate of those marooned in Stalingrad. Far more than the success or failure of the struggle for one city was now at stake. In von Manstein's own words, While the eyes of all Germany were on Stalingrad at the turn of 1942 to 43, and anxious hearts prayed for the sons who fought there the southern wing of the Eastern Front was simultaneously the scene of a struggle even greater than that being waged for the lives and freedom of the 6th Army's gallant 200,000. The issue was no longer the fate of a single army, but the entire southern wing of the front, and ultimately, of all the German armies in the East. By Christmas Eve, the Red Army was within striking distance of Rostov. Only two days earlier, Army Group A had begun its withdrawal from the Caucasus. Should the Russians reach Rostov before them, their retreat would be cut off. The ordinary German soldiers only gradually became aware of the magnitude of the disaster which was upon them. The truth was slowly borne in on us as, dragging all they had with them, the remnants of defeated division after division fell back from all sides before the on-pressing enemy, crowding and cramming into the heart of the cauldron. Gradually the columns of converging transport blocked all roads. On the road guns were blown up and weapons of all kinds, tanks included, which had come to a standstill for want of fuel. Fully laden lorries blocked in the snow went up in flames. Munition dumps were sprung. Vast supplies of provisions and clothing had to become huge fireworks so as not to fall into enemy hands. <laughs> 
Installations erected at enormous effort were wiped out wholesale. The country for miles around was strewn with smaller equipment, tin hats, gas masks and cases, ground sheets, cooking utensils, ammo pouches, trenching tools, even rifles, machine pistols and grenades. All of this stuff had been thrown away because it had become a mere hindrance. By the new year, the 4th Panzer Army, having abandoned the 6th Army to its fate, had withdrawn as far as Rostov. It provided the only effective barrier between the advance of Soviet forces and the capture of the city. By January the 7th, the Red Army was only 30 miles from Rostov, but remained slow to exploit its superiority. Hitler also remained slow to order a complete evacuation of the South. He waited until the 27th of January, when Army Group A seemed doomed to finally allow its retreat through Rostov. On the 4th of February, the city fell to the Russians. The German 17th Army remained in the Caucasus, ordered to hold the Tarman Peninsula and the Kuban bridgehead to the Crimea. In Stalingrad, the situation of the 6th Army had deteriorated rapidly throughout January. On the 8th, von Paulus was offered terms for a surrender by the Russians. Hitler refused to allow him to capitulate. Four days later, the 6th Army reported, Heavy weapons now immobilized. Severe losses and inadequate supplies, together with the cold, have considerably reduced troops' powers of resistance. If enemy maintains attack at present strength, unlikely to hold out more than a few days longer. The actuality was far more graphic. German troops were collapsing from starvation and exhaustion. They were dying of exposure and some were committing suicide. Even when Army Group A had been withdrawn beyond Rostov, and the 6th Army's continued resistance served no strategic purpose, Hitler refused to allow them to surrender. On January the 31st, he made von Paulus a field marshal. The following day, von Paulus surrendered. He became the first field marshal since the unification of the state to fall into enemy hands. Announcing the disaster at Stalingrad to the rest of the forces in the east, the German high command requested that officers in the field read out the last message received by shortwave radio from the ruins of the tractor factory Red October. We are the last seven survivors in this place. Four of us are wounded. We have been entrenched in the wreckage of the tractor factory for four days. We have not had any food for four days. I have just opened the last magazine for my automatic. In 10 minutes, the Bolsheviks will overrun us. Tell my father that I have done my duty and that I shall know how to die. Long live Germany, Heil Hitler. The jubilant Russian forces now surged westwards to bring the fight to the enemy. A war correspondent, Alexander Wirth, described the scene on the road from Stalingrad. This area in which the battle had raged only so very recently was now hundreds of miles from the front, and all the forces in Stalingrad were now being moved towards Rostov and the Donets. Weird-looking figures were regulating the traffic. Soldiers in long white camouflaged cloaks and pointed white hoods. Horses, horses, 
and still more horses, blowing steam and with ice around their nostrils, were wading through the deep snow, pulling guns and gun carriages and large covered wagons and hundreds of lorries with their headlights full on. To the side of the road, an enormous bonfire was burning and shadow-like figures danced around, warming themselves. Then others would light a plank and start a bonfire of their own till the whole edge of the road was a series of bonfires. Thousands of soldiers were marching, or rather walking in large irregular crowds, through the west, through this cold, deadly night. But they were cheerful and strangely happy. They kept shouting about Stalingrad and the job they had done. Westward, westward. After Stalingrad, the full fury of the Russian counteroffensive was unleashed against the retreating Germans. To the north of Voronezh, the Soviet attack had taken Kursk by the 7th of February. Kharkov fell on the 16th, despite the orders of Hitler that it be held to the last man. A major push southwards towards the Sea of Azov and westwards towards the river Dnieper threatened to completely encircle the remaining forces of Army Group Don and the section of Army Group A, which had escaped from the Caucasus. The numbers with which the Russians attacked and the speed of their advance now proved their downfall. Crippled by lack of transport, bogged down in the early thaw and short of supplies, the Soviet thrust suddenly ran out of steam only 30 miles from the Dnieper crossing. Von Manstein immediately seized this opportunity to methodically chop off the spearheads of the Russian attack and stabilize the German front. Only a month after being retaken by the Russians, Kharkov was once again in German hands. By the 19th of March, Belgorod, more than 50 miles northeast of Kharkov, was also retaken. The thaw was now in full flood and the annual spring lull descended on the whole of the Eastern Front. For the German army, it marked the close of a disastrous winter campaign. The Caucasus had been lost, as well as a large section of the Donetsk Basin and the strategic Don Bend. The Sixth Army had been destroyed Four other Axis armies had been gutted, and Stalingrad now lay 500 miles to the west of the German lines. Yet, in the end, the German generals counted themselves lucky that the situation was not far graver. Once again, during the winter of 1943, the Germans had found themselves retreating, having come tantalizingly close to reaching their ambitions and objectives. One of the retreating German troops described their withdrawal. Completely cut off, the men in field grey just slouched on. Invariably filthy and invariably louse-ridden, their weary shoulders sagging from one defensive position to another. The icy winds of those great white wastes, which stretched forever beyond us to the east, lashed a million white crystals of razor-like snow into their unshaven faces, Skin now loose, stretched over bone, so utter was the exhaustion, so utter the starvation. And whenever any individual could do no more, when even the onward driving lash of fear of death ceased to have any meaning, then, like an engine which has used its last drop of fuel, the debilitated body ran down and came to a standstill. Soon, a kindly shroud of snow covered the object and only the toe of a jackboot or an arm frozen to stone could remind you that what was now an elongated white hammock had quite recently been a human being. 
The twin failures of Stalingrad and the Caucasus were enormous psychological bombshells for German morale. The German army's belief in its own invincibility, dented by the retreat from Moscow, had now completely disintegrated. As supreme warlord, most of the blame for this lay squarely on the shoulders of Adolf Hitler. However, while the military tactics of Hitler were proving increasingly impossible for his generals to stomach, the political blunderings of the brutal and debauched administrators of occupied Russia were presenting them with a problem no less indigestible. For long stretches of the previous year, as many as 24 divisions of the German army had been diverted to attempting to suppress the growing menace of partisan sabotage. The rabid massacre of Soviet Jews, the indiscriminate torture and slaying of simple peasants, and the massive scale of reprisals in the wake of the slightest resistance had totally backfired against the Reich's commissars of the conquered territories. Far from inducing a paralyzing terror among the Russians, their excesses became the most effective recruiting campaign the partisans could wish for. In May of 1942, the first attempt was made to coordinate the disparate bands of partisans which had formed in response to the savage Untermensch policies of the German occupation. Republican and regional partisan headquarters were set up and an official liaison between the movement and the Red Army was established for the first time. This meant that the activities of the partisans could now be directed against objectives of crucial importance to the overall military strategy. Training centers set up in 1941 were expanded to provide recruits with a rapid and comprehensive grounding in the art of guerrilla warfare. Partisans were taught demolition procedures, wireless operating, intelligence gathering, and how to forge and amend official German documentation. Where the geography of the region allowed it, such as in the Ukraine or Bryansk, the partisans operated in military bands of thousands of resistance fighters, which kept close communication ties with the army and civilian population. The underground Communist Party organization was strengthened to provide a rudimentary governmental structure in the occupied areas. One of the most constant and rewarding targets of the partisans were the German rail connections with their active fronts. No matter what precautions the German army took, the partisans still seemed to manage to outwit them. Farid Fazliarmetu, a miner, later described how... The Germans built fortifications, laid mines around crossings, stations and bridges, and chopped down trees on both sides of the tracks. Guards mowed down people who appeared on the tracks or anywhere near them. We often watched German sappers with dogs and mine detectors moving down railway tracks. We would lay our mines after the guards had passed. Fooling the bloodhounds was more difficult. They had been trained to nose out tolite, a compound of TNT, so they found the mines. Then we started to divert their attention by dropping little bits of tolite here and there. The dogs would mistake these for mines. They would then be punished for that and start ignoring the real mines. The Germans remarked wryly, the partisans have even recruited our dogs. Besides the damage they inflicted on German troops and their morale, the partisans offered hope and example to those still in the midst of Nazi tyranny. <laughs> 
Zoya Kosmodiemianskaya, an 18-year-old member of the Moscow Komsomol, was caught setting fire to German stables in the village of Pestrehevo. Although tortured, she revealed nothing about her comrades to the German interrogators. As she was led to the gallows with a placard around her neck describing her crime, she turned to her German captors and proclaimed defiantly, you can't hang all 190 million of us. The story of Zoya Kosmodiemianskaya was circulated widely and she became a national heroine. Zoya grew to be a symbol not only of partisan resistance, but the defiance of Russian womanhood in the face of the most terrible adversity. Ludmila Pavlyshenka, a sniper who would eventually account for 300 German soldiers, was one of the first to challenge the prejudices of the Soviet military structure. I joined the army when women were not yet accepted there. I had the option of becoming a nurse, but I refused, because I had learned to shoot before the war. Only after my insistent requests did my regimental sergeant major take me on as a sniper. I did not take up arms because I wanted to kill, but because I had seen ruined cities, villages razed to the ground, bereaved children, old folk, women and children murdered. Sharing the responsibilities of the frontline soldier also meant sharing the risk of death and mutilation. I was wounded in battle when the odds were heavily against us. Both legs and my hip bone were smashed, but I managed to crawl to the forest where I lay semi-conscious in the snow all night. When I was evacuated to Moscow, both my legs had to be amputated. As soon as I was discharged from hospital, I went back to my old factory. It wasn't all that easy to stand on a shift with my artificial limbs, but the thought that it was no easier where the fighting was kept me going. I was only 20 at the time, and my life was just beginning. Like Katerina Yelena, a whole generation of young women lost their youth, and some, like the poet Yulia Darina, felt that they were in danger of losing their sexual identity as well. Unharvested rye waves in masses. We also stride through it, the lasses, looking just like the lads. That is no hut that is blazing. That is my youth turned to ashes. Through the war go the lasses, looking just like the lads. But while the distinctions between male and female soldiers might become blurred, according to Katerina Boschkariona, the relationships between frontline nurses and their convalescent patients were as classical as ever. What was a girl to say to a soldier who was going to battle tomorrow, whose chance of returning was so slim, and who on top of everything else was so attractive? See you after the war? At that time, death stood ready and waiting behind each and every one of us. Besides, life will go its own way, even if there's a war on. Marriages were solemnized. Abortions banned in the country in those days were permitted in field hospitals. Those who wished to have their babies were demobbed, provided with an allowance, and sent home. Many of us remained single all our lives. The happiness of frontline love was short-lived. Away from the front line, a woman's life could be equally tough. In Leningrad, Leonid Pantele witnessed the tragic dilemma of a young mother. There was a young woman with twins living with me in the same house. That first winter of the blockade, they were both dying. She too was not long for this world. She looked weak, lost and alone with her dependent ration card. One day she made a decision. I don't know what to call it, a crime, or a feat of bravery. She realized she would not be able to save both her sons, so she stopped feeding one of them and he died. The second pulled through though. I saw him yesterday. A thin, pale and sad looking boy, but he was alive. The nightmare of raising children in a war of this magnitude 
sent the birth rate plummeting to the point where it became a grave concern of the authorities. There was also the obvious factor that men were away at the front for periods of over a year without returning on leave. Many of them were never to return at all. Dmitry Kedrin was riveted by the heartbreak which this caused. What kind of ears were granted me that deafened by thundering, clamorous strife, I can hear from the war's whole symphony only the crying of the soldier's wife? Despite the suffering which the German invasion had brought about, the spring of 1943 seemed to infuse the consciousness of the Russian people with a new sense of optimism. The survival of Stalingrad and the ensuing counterattack had shown that not only could the German tide of victory be stemmed, it could be reversed. The people of the Soviet Union had taken everything that the Germans could throw at them and the nation had held. By now, the majority of the population were willing cogs in a gigantic war machine. Civilians and soldiers alike seemed to grasp a new awareness of their role in the bitter conflict which raged all around them. At the beginning of the war, there was still some complacency. Since we would win anyway, Perhaps there was no need for a superhuman effort on our part. Perhaps things would work out without us. But the Germans poured on the lead without looking. A bitter joke in circulation from Stalingrad told of a soldier going into battle carrying 150 cartridges. When he was carried to the field hospital, he had 151. He hadn't even had a chance to fire his gun. That was another extreme, contempt of death. This was written about and acclaimed as valor. But by mid-1942, there was too much of this contempt around, and yet the distance to victory was as great as ever. Sometimes the going gets so hard that death seems a welcome deliverance. Those are no empty words. Gradually, they stopped writing about this contempt of death. The mission of the soldier was not to die with dashing defiance, but to kill the enemy. The authorities continuously attempted to control the morale and attitudes of the frontline troops by the almost obsessional production of reading matter. Newspapers were printed on a portable plant which moved around with the troops. Each front, each army and each division produced its own newspaper. The Ministry of Defence produced the Red Star paper and the national newspapers were also distributed to the soldiers. By 1943, the conditions of the Russian troops at the front had improved tremendously. The spring lull meant that soldiers who had gone for months without washing could now visit the steam baths which had been erected behind the lines. The break in the fighting gave the field tailors' shops the chance to repair damaged uniforms sped up the delivery of precious letters from home and allowed the exhausted troops a much needed period of rest and relaxation. While the conditions of the Russian soldiers continued to improve as the war wore on, the lot of their German counterparts began to deteriorate. In fact, by the spring of 1943, the German army in the east was almost on the point of collapse. In March, the Eastern Front, still extending from Finland in the north to the Black Sea in the south, was almost half a million men short of establishment. Divisional strength had been reduced from nine to six battalions, while the casualty rate among experienced officers and NCOs had been particularly high. Equipment levels were low. For example, by February, only 500 German tanks remained serviceable and most of these were still inferior to the Russian T-34s. The situation in the Panzer Brigades became so desperate that Hitler was forced to recall General Heinz Guderian to active service. Guderian, one of the most able and audacious of the Panzer leaders, 
had been dismissed from his command in the winter of 1941, ironically for withdrawing forces without permission. He was now charged with responsibility for the future development of the armoured troops along lines that will make the arm of the service into a decisive weapon for winning the war. Guderian was encouraged by the continued upswing in the production of the PZKW-6 Tiger tanks. 56 tons of well-armoured mobile artillery armed with a modification of the devastating 8.2 centimetre anti-aircraft gun. The Tiger boasted a top speed of 23 miles per hour on the road. Combined with the PZKW-5 Panther, the Tiger gave the Germans qualitative parity with the Russians for the first time since the beginning of the war. The Panther, weighing 45 tons, was lighter and more mobile than the Tiger, with a top speed of 34 miles per hour, while its 7.5 centimeter gun possessed considerable penetrative ability. Improved assault guns and tank destroyers were also appearing. Taking into account the upgunning of the Panzer Marks III and IV, the potential of German armor had never been greater. The problem for Guderian was to supply these weapons in such quantities that their possession by experienced crews would offset Soviet numerical superiority. Guderian's need for time to reorganize and re-equip the Panzer divisions mirrored the requirements of the German army as a whole. The idea of any immediate victory in Russia was now simply the stuff of rhetoric. According to von Manstein, what did seem possible, given proper leadership on the German side, was that the Soviet Union could be worn down to such an extent that it would tire of its excessive sacrifices, 12 million killed or captured, and be ready to accept a stalemate. Given the inability of the German army to defend its complete front, such a draw could not be achieved by defensive tactics. The reverses to be imposed on the Red Army would have to be forced by a series of limited assaults. Von Manstein's counterattacks, which had prevented complete disaster during the previous winter, had impressed Hitler. He was invited to put forward a plan for the crucial summer campaign. Von Manstein presented Hitler with two offensive alternatives. The first was to prepare for a Soviet assault, which would almost certainly be launched in the Ukraine and withdraw before it. Wheeling to the left, German forces would then mount a decisive attack on its exposed northern flank, encircling the leading spearhead of the Russian advance. The second alternative was to cut off the enormous Soviet salient which had emerged to the north of Kharkov and to the south of Orel, a bulge extending 70 miles westward from Kursk and measuring approximately 100 miles in width. Hitler chose the second alternative, despite the dilemma which it posed for the attacking forces. It was vital to attack before the Soviet generals got wind of the plan and could prepare defenses. It was also crucial to von Manstein that the offensive be launched before the Russians recovered from the losses incurred the previous winter. On the other hand, if the attack were to take place in mid-May, as von Manstein insisted, German manpower and equipment might not be sufficient to ensure victory. Guderian was against the operation from the start arguing that the new Panther and Tiger tanks must be held back until they were available in sufficient quantities to ensure a decisive success. Hitler postponed the date of the attack until July, in the hope that by then, the number of new tanks would tip the balance of firepower in Germany's favor. By now, Russian Air Force reconnaissance had improved to the point where Stalin's awareness of German dispositions was comprehensive and generally accurate. He had also managed to infiltrate German headquarters and was supplied with additional intelligence by his spy ring in Switzerland, codenamed Lucy, which had many high-level contacts inside Germany. Stalin's knowledge of German preparations was so precise, he even knew the date chosen by Hitler 
for the launch of Operation Citadel against the Kursk salient. With every passing moment, the successful outcome of the Kursk offensive grew more necessary for Hitler. German morale, depleted by the failures at Stalingrad and in the Caucasus, was now further undermined by defeat in West Africa. Hitler's inability to adequately supply Rommel with men and materials led to disaster at Medanin in March and the eventual collapse of the Axis African forces in May. By June, southern Europe lay totally exposed to the threat of Allied attack. In Britain, the RAF and the American Air Force prepared to launch massive bombing raids against German industrial and civilian targets as a prelude to invasion from the West. Hitler not only needed a victory at Kursk, he needed victory on a scale which would allow him the breathing space to fend off the enemies which were beginning to close around him. Anything less would prove a catastrophe. Stalin, advised by Zhukov, prepared patiently and thoroughly for the German advance. The Soviet lines consisted of six belts of defenders composed of anti-tank posts, thick minefields, and 3,000 miles of trenches, supported by 3,000 tanks and 20,000 guns. For the first time, the Red Army would be prepared for a major German offensive. It was determined to make the most of its advantage. On July the 5th, 1943, as von Manstein and von Kluger approached the Kursk salient in a classic pincer movement involving one million men and 2,700 tanks, the death ride of the panzers was about to commence. This attack is of decisive importance. It must succeed, and it must do so rapidly and convincingly. The victory at Kursk must be a blazing torch to the world. Adolf Hitler was fully aware of the absolute necessity of success at Kursk. But when the roaring waves of German armor crashed into the salient in July 1943, the attack which the German army was about to unleash was already doomed to failure. The essence of von Manstein's strategy for the battle had been to exploit the mobility and tactical superiority of the German panzer units. Instead, the German tanks drove confidently towards a grinding war of attrition, where the advantage lay squarely with the defenders. When the first enemy tanks appeared, we all started counting them. I personally tried several times, but lost count. I remember the last time I got to something like 30 but more and more came lumbering out of the wood. Only when the distance between us and the tanks was four to five hundred meters did we open fire. One after another, the tanks went down. The enemy apparently never dreamed that one gun dared to engage 36 tanks and an infantry landing. No doubt they thought they had run into considerable forces. This excerpt from the diary of Gunnery Sergeant Nikolai Kanischev confirms the effectiveness of a Russian defense which limited the progress of von Kluger's 9th Army to an advance of some six miles. It was then ground to a halt by Rokossovsky's central front to the north of the Kursk salient. In the south, von Manstein's 4th Panzer Army advanced 25 miles by the 10th of July and threatened to penetrate the Voronezh front under Marshal Fatutin. Reserves from the steppe's front to the north had to be pumped into the battle to bolster the salient's defenders and prevent the 4th Panzers from breaking through into open country. By now, the incredible waves of armoured might thrown at each other by both sides had fully engaged and the contest began to degenerate into a series of localised slugging matches. On the black scorched earth, the gutted tanks burned like torches. 
it was difficult to establish which side was attacking and which defending. But in the face of the reinforcements from the north, von Manstein's forces gathered themselves for a final titanic effort. The result was the biggest tank battle in military history. 1,500 tanks met in a head-on confrontation which showed armored warfare at its crudest and most brutal. While both sides suffered heavy casualties, the second arm of the German pincer movement was finally paralyzed. The Germans had fallen into Zhukov's cunningly prepared trap. As Guderian acknowledged, By the failure of Citadel, we had suffered a decisive defeat. The armored formations, reformed and re-equipped with much effort, had lost heavily both in manpower and equipment, and would now be unemployable for a long time to come. It was problematical whether they could be rehabilitated in time to defend the Eastern Front. From now on, the enemy was in undisputed possession of the initiative. Having enticed the Germans into the total but disastrous commitment of their armored forces, the Red Army swiftly exploited their advantage. Even while the gargantuan tank struggle was still being bitterly contested, on the 12th of July, the Russians counterattacked towards Orel, which was itself a salient in German hands. Army Group Center, reinforced by units from the 4th Panzer Army, which had broken off its attack on Kursk, attempted to check the advance. But by now, the Eastern Front was not the only theater of disaster for the German armies. On the 10th of July, Allied forces had invaded Sicily. By the 25th, Mussolini had been arrested and a provisional government set up in Italy. Fearing the defection of his Mediterranean ally, Hitler desperately needed to make troops available for the defense of the peninsula. On August the 1st, he ordered an immediate withdrawal from the Orel salient. By the 5th of August, the provincial capitals of Orel and Belgorod had been liberated. Near Belgorod, the Germans attempted a counterattack with 60,000 troops and 18,000 Hitler youth, who arrived at the front carrying flags with the ironic inscription, the world belongs to us. The ensuing battle rapidly described by Guy Sire of the Gross Deutschland Division tempered their youthful arrogance. It is difficult to remember moments when there is nothing under a steel helmet but an astonishingly empty head and a pair of eyes which translate nothing more than the eyes of an animal facing mortal danger. There is nothing but the rhythm of explosions and the cries of madmen, to be classified later as the cries of heroes or murderers. And there are the cries of the wounded, of the agonizing dying shrieking as they stare at a part of their body reduced to pulp. The cries of men touched by the shock of battle, who run in any and every direction, howling like banshees. There are the tragic, unbelievable visions which carry from one moment of nausea to the next, guts splattered across the rubble and sprayed from one dying man to another. Tightly riveted machines ripped like the belly of a cow which has just been sliced open trees broken into tiny fragments, gaping windows pouring out torrents of billowing dust, dispersing into oblivion all that remains of a comfortable parlor. The frenzied German counterstroke succeeded in pushing back the Red Army, but the Russian tide of resurgence was irresistible. After clawing their way forward for 10 days, the German advance was again flung back towards the Dnieper and the great retreat 
is about to begin. The all-conquering German army, which had disdainfully swept aside the Russian border defences only two years previously, was now struggling to maintain a presence on the field of battle. The panzer units, which had sliced the Red Army to pieces in a series of dazzling pincer movements, now flung themselves headlong at the Russians in the desperate hope of slowing their progress. For the ordinary German soldiers, the notion of victory ceased to have meaning. The survival of themselves and their immediate comrades became the central concern of their lives. On the Russian side, the liberation of the cities and towns in their path was proving a bittersweet experience. In Orel, the Soviet troops arrived to find half the town destroyed and all its bridges demolished by the retreating Germans. Of the pre-war population of 114,000, only 30,000 haggard souls survived to greet their saviors. 25,000 had been sent as slaves to the labor camps of the Reich. 12,000 had been murdered by their German overlords, and thousands had died from disease and starvation. The mood of the retreating Germans was one of intense frustration and manic desperation. Even the most hermetically sealed of our men understood that no matter how many hundreds of Russians he killed or how bravely he fought, the next day hundreds more would appear, and so on for the next day and the day after that. And even the blinders saw that the Russian soldiers were moved by a blind heroism and boldness so that even a mountain of dead compatriots wouldn't stop them. We didn't wish to die and would kill and massacre as if to avenge ourselves in advance for what was about to happen. When we died, it was with fury because we hadn't been able to exact enough retribution. This fury would now be unleashed towards civilians and soldiers indiscriminately. The Germans had been decisively defeated, but the war in the East was far from over. The only hope for the armies of the Reich in the midst of this desperate retreat now lay in holding the line of the River Dnieper. Sometimes we would try to run away, but orders, adroitly worded and spaced, soothed us like shots of morphine. On the Dnieper, we were told everything will be easier Ivan won't be able to force the barrage. So courage and do your best to hold him if you want everyone to get through. The Russian counter-offensive will be crushed on the Dnieper and then we will resume our push to the east. Even though a strategic withdrawal to the Dnieper seemed the only possible option for the ragged German formations, Hitler initially stuck to his intransigent policy of holding territory to the last man. Von Tippelskirch, one of the German generals in the east, summed up the helpless rage of the field commanders forced to sacrifice men and material to a principle of no withdrawal, which had now been elevated to a moral necessity. The series of withdrawals by adequately large steps would have worn down the Russian strength. Besides creating opportunities for counterstrokes when the German forces were numerous enough to make them effective, the root cause of German defeat was the way that her forces were wasted in fruitless efforts and, above all, fruitless resistance at the wrong time and place. By the 23rd of August, Kharkov was once again in Russian hands. By the 30th, Taganrog had fallen. The capture of Donbass was followed by Novrosik, and by the 25th of September, Smolensk had also been retaken. In the face of such irresistible momentum, even Hitler had to concede that the waters of the Dnieper represented the only possibility of regrouping the decimated German divisions. For the pursuing Red Army, 
The liberation of the towns and villages east of the Dnieper continued to fill the hearts of its soldiers with a succession of contrasting emotions. Boris Shugiev was part of the force that liberated Belarusia. A farm woman came running to our forward line, tears streaming down her face. She said, Sons, come and see what those monsters have done. In the village by the house that had served the Nazis as a field hospital, she showed us a pit which had been covered with soil. That soil still breathed and moved. We shoveled it away, and the sight of what was underneath filled us with horror. The pit was full of the bodies of little boys and girls aged between 10 and 12 years. The Nazi butchers had used them to give blood transfusions to their wounded officers and had then dumped them into the pit. I sincerely hope that no one ever feels what we did at that moment. For the others, such as Vladimir Varbarov, the horror of the atrocities was diluted by the welcome of the survivors. On the far end of the village, the enemy is still massing for a counter-attack to drive us out. Then, from the cellars and basements of half-ruined houses, out of dugouts, running, climbing and clambering, came our long-suffering countrymen. Dressed in indescribable rags, women whose age it is impossible to tell, children and old people all rush to embrace us, clinging and sobbing. Our men have come, they cry. But we, electrified by such a reception and flushed by the ongoing battle, keep peering apprehensively over our shoulders, alert for a gun battle around the corner, for a German counterattack. Extricating ourselves gently from clasping arms, we reach the far end of what was now our village once again, clearing it of the Germans as we go. The exhilaration of the liberators is comparable to none other. This is a joy that will last you for the rest of your life, till your dying day. By the second half of September, the Russians had pressed the retreating Germans back to the banks of the Dnieper. The myth of Aryan superiority was wearing thin for the pursuing Red Army. A poem by Mikhail Lukonin encapsulated the mood of the advancing forces with its heavy irony. Just look at the wall where the shells pass through. Can you see where the writing is clear? We are supermen, and to prove it, the fascists march row upon row as they mutter together with their hands in the air. Our tank rolls on to new tasks in haste. We nudge each other's ribs as we read, in Gothic, on a smoke-blackened fragment of wall, the slogan, We're an invincible breed. However, even in retreat, the elite units of the German army, such as the Gross Deutschland Division, managed to maintain something of their reputations by mounting a ferocious defense of the German rear. We withdrew to the Dnieper and safety, slowing down the enemy as much as we could. Our desperate efforts continued for days at a time across hundreds of miles. When men who had escaped from rearguard units finally reached the river, they were confronted by a vast human swarm. Entire armies were waiting beside the few bridges our engineers had managed to restore, tramping up and down, climbing onto anything that would float. But the Dnieper was not to prove the refuge the battered German troops had been promised. Even as their defensive perimeter finally withdrew to the river's edge, they found the Russians already established there. Goaded onwards by their commanders, by the atrocities they had witnessed, and the prospect of sweeping the enemy from the motherland, the Russians dispatched the German rear guard and immediately prepared to continue their pursuit. Between the 22nd and the 30th of September, the Russians had forced numerous crossings of the 300-mile stretch of river between the Pripyat marshes and Zaporozhye. Further south, 
by the 23rd of October, Zoporoshie and Melitop were taken by the Russians, and the 17th German army was isolated in the Crimea, reducing the dwindling strength of their eastern forces by a further quarter of a million. To the north, Kiev fell on the 6th of November, threatening the northern flank of Army Group South's defense of the Dnipro Bend. This Soviet pressure continued throughout November and December. Despite von Manstein's pleas to abandon what was now a vulnerable salient, Hitler remained adamant that the Dnipro Bend was to be held at all costs. By the new year of 1944, the line of German resistance from the Baltic to the Black Sea had either collapsed or was suffering such Russian pressure as to make it untenable. In Italy, the Allies had landed on September the 3rd and were battling their way up the peninsula. Back in Germany, the Reich was experiencing destruction from the air on a scale never before experienced by any nation at war. In the first major blow against Hamburg, 30,000 people perished in a series of raids which left many more scarred and burned. Hamburg was swept by a holocaust which created such intense firestorms that tornadoes were formed which sucked living people into the flames. Huge bomber formations were circling over Hamburg. The entire sky was lit with hundreds of flares. Amidst the roaring and rumbling, the whizzing and whistling of the falling bombs passing through the air seemed never to end. Throughout the latter half of 1944, the bombing raids increased in intensity until on the 22nd of November, the heaviest air raid of the war was launched against Berlin. Almost two and a half tons of bombs were dropped in 30 minutes. The noose around Germany was tightening rapidly, and the new year on the Eastern Front offered no relief from the process of strangulation. By January the 2nd, the Russians had advanced north of Kiev and were now just 18 miles from the 1939 Polish border. On the 14th, the offensive which came to be known as the liberation of Leningrad was launched. Soviet forces smashed through the German defensive positions around the city, clearing the territory as far as Novgorod. On the 17th of January, the besieged city was finally liberated. Leningrad had endured 900 days of isolation and unbelievable hardship. Over one million people had died. These pages from the diary of Tanya Savisheva, a young girl who lived in the city during the siege, poignantly catalogued the destruction of the entire family. Shenya died 28th December at 12 o'clock, 1941. Granny died 25th January, 3 in the afternoon, 1942. Lekka died 17th March at 5 in the morning, 1942. Uncle Vajia died 13th April, 2 at night, 1942. Uncle Lyosha, 10th May, at 4 in the afternoon, 1942. Mummy, 13th May at 7.30 in the morning, 1942. The Savichevas are dead, all dead, all dead. On the 4th of March, the northern flank of von Manstein's Army Group South was pierced by the 1st Ukrainian Front under the direct command of Marshal Zhukov. By the 7th, after advancing 100 miles, the Russians were astride the Warsaw-Odessa railway line. And by the 28th, Nick Dayev on the bug had been captured. Further south, the river Dnestra was crossed and Kherson at the mouth of the Dnipro overrun. By April, 
The Red Army's overstretched supply lines in the spring floods dictated an end to what was now being named the Mud Offensive. In the Crimea, however, the Russians continued to attack, and Sevastopol was retaken on the 19th of May, bringing the north shore of the Black Sea into Soviet hands once more. While the Russians were threatening the southern sector of the Eastern Front with collapse, events were unfolding off the south coast of England, which would completely alter the complexion of the war in the East. The long-awaited Second Front was about to be created. A fleet of over 5,000 vessels had been gathered together for the invasion of France. 1,200 naval vessels were on hand to sweep for mines, bombard the German coastal defences, and protect the invaders from airborne and naval assault. 4,000 ships, barges, tugs and amphibious craft were available for the transportation of the two million men and their weapons, which were to be landed on the northern coast of France over a two-month period. Two Mulberry harbours as large as medium-sized ports were to be towed across the channel in sections and constructed close to the French shore. In the air, 7,500 aircraft were mustered for the direct support of the invasion. In the early hours of the morning of the 6th of June, the first Allied paratroopers were dropped behind the targeted beaches. At dawn, five landing parties approached these beaches from the sea. Despite setbacks such as the gale on the 19th of June which wrecked one Mulberry Harbour and severely damaged the second, by the first week in July, one million Allied soldiers had been landed. While the attention of the world focused on the D-Day landing and its aftermath, the Red Army launched a fresh offensive against Army Group Center in Belarusia. Most of the 3rd Panzer Army was destroyed within a few days. At the beginning of July, a further 100,000 German troops were encircled at Minsk. In another week, Army Group Center had been completely destroyed. An incision 250 miles wide had been sliced in the German front, and casualties were estimated at 300,000. The Russian army now had a clear pathway to East Prussia and the Baltic. The failure of the Germans to deal with the summer offensive was emerging as a disaster on such a scale that even the debacle of Stalingrad paled in comparison. The war correspondent, Alexander Wirth, reported from the Russian capital. In Moscow today, all hearts are filled with joy. Every night, a familiar, deep male voice, speaking like a man giving orders to soldiers, announces a new major victory. Division after division has been encircled and wiped out. Hundreds of thousands killed and about a hundred thousand taken prisoner. The score of generals captured is about 25. Of these 100,000 or so prisoners, 57,000 were paraded through the streets of Moscow with their generals at their head. The Moscow crowd was remarkably disciplined. They watched the Germans walk, or rather shuffle past, in their dirty grey-green uniforms. This grey-green mould which had rotted away half of European Russia and was still rotting a great part of Europe. The Moscow people looked on quietly without booing or hissing, and only a few youngsters could be heard shouting, hey, look at the Fritzes with their ugly snouts. But most people only exchanged remarks in soft voices. I heard a little girl perched on her mother's shoulders say, mummy, are these the people who killed daddy? and the mother hugged the child and wept. <laughs> 
the Germans had finally arrived in Moscow. When the parade was over, Russian sanitation trucks disinfected the streets. By the middle of July, the Germans had been swept from Belarusia, and the Russians held much of northeast Poland. As they drove northwards into Lithuania, Army Group North was threatened with encirclement. South of the Pripyat Marsh, Army Group North Ukraine were flung back beyond Lvov and Lublin. By the end of the month, units of the Red Army had reached the Vistula and were attacking the Warsaw suburbs. On the 1st of August, the Polish Home Army Command in London, anxious that the Polish capital should not fall into the hands of the advancing Soviets, ordered the Warsaw partisans to rise against their Nazi oppressors. It was to prove a tragic mistake. The 20,000 insurgents held only enough ammunition for seven days fighting. By the end of the battle, after two months of bitter struggle, nine-tenths of the city had been destroyed. 200,000 people had been massacred and the rest deported to extermination camps. The SS had organized an orgy of savagery, dousing people with petrol and setting them alight, gassing them in sewers and subjecting them to a nightmare regime of torture and out-of-hand execution. During this period, the Red Army remained on the outskirts of the city. Stalin was accused of standing by while this barbarous campaign of reprisal wiped out any opposition to Russian domination of Poland. On the 20th of August, the Soviet army unexpectedly launched a major offensive against Romania, which was almost completely devoid of air and panzer reserves. By the 23rd, 20 German divisions had been encircled in a giant pocket between the rivers Donetsk and Prut. According to the military historian Zimka, In executing their breakthroughs, the Russians showed an elegance in their tactical conceptions economy of force and control that did not fall short of the Germans' own performance in the early war years. The effect of these reverses on Hitler was catastrophic. Increasingly, he retreated into a semi-fantasy world which only partly corresponded to the realities of the battlefield. In the words of Alan Bullock, one of his most astute biographers, until he could force events to conform to the pattern he sought to impose and reappear as the magician vindicated, he hid himself away in his headquarters. Hitler's ostensible reason for shutting himself away was the demands made on him by the war. But there was a deeper psychological compulsion at work. Here he lived in a private world of his own from which the ugly and awkward facts of Germany's situation were excluded. He refused to visit the bombed towns, just as he refused to read reports which contradicted the picture he wanted to form. The commanders in the East, nevertheless, had to deal with the orders of this shambling reclusive, who was now a pathetic shadow of the decisive, intuitive and supremely arrogant leader who had launched Operation Barbarossa only three years previously. A leader who even in 1943 could declare, I am no ordinary soldier king, but a warlord, probably the most successful in history. By now, Hitler had survived numerous assassination attempts, most of them originating in the upper echelons of the army command structure. The most effective came in July 1944, when Colonel Count Klaus von Stauffenberg carried a bomb in a briefcase into Hitler's headquarters in East Prussia and left it beneath a conference table. Back in Berlin, other officers waited for Stauffenberg to return before taking over the capital. But Hitler emerged from the blast relatively unscathed and soon the plotters were paying the price for their failure. 
Stauffenberg was shot by a firing squad in the courtyard of the war ministry. Ludwig Beck, former chief of staff, committed suicide. On the day following the attempt, a lightning series of arrests and executions took place. Some of the conspirators were beheaded. Others hanged from meat hooks to die by strangulation. More were shipped off to the death camps to be gassed, hanged or shot. According to General Guderian, Hitler's mistrust now reached extremes, and the miracle of his survival gave him greater faith than ever in his mission. He lost himself more and more in a realm of the imagination which had no basis in reality. Every free expression of opinion and every objection to his frequently incomprehensible views evoked an outburst of rage on his part. The result, according to General von Westphal, was that the gulf between the Führer and the German army leaders was now unbridgeable. It arose from irreconcilable conflict between concrete and abstract thinking, between sober objectivity and the chasing of fantasies, between logical calculation based on facts and the attempt to force the facts to fit impossible desires. It was an intense spiritual torment for every thinking German soldier to be unable to ward off the impending military and moral disaster, to have to look on while everything was wasted and squandered. By the middle of 1944, the entire senior leadership on the Eastern Front had been replaced. Von Kuschler, von Manstein, von Kleist and Bush had all been removed. In some cases, their successors were themselves almost immediately dismissed for their failure to live up to Hitler's expectations. While Hitler struggled to impose his illusions on an increasingly reluctant reality, Stalin's grasp of realpolitik had never been stronger. Confident now of victory, he paused on the Vistula, and encouraged the formation of a provisional communist Polish government in Lublin. Seeking to maximize the Russian sphere of influence far beyond its pre-war boundaries, he sent the Red Army of Liberation northwards into the Baltic and southwest into the Balkans. By the 31st of August, Bucharest had been entered. An essentially communist government was formed and Romania was compelled to ratify its 1940 loss of territory to Russia. It was also forced to pay the Soviet Union a financial indemnity and use its army to fight against its erstwhile allies. The Red Army had advanced 250 miles in 12 days. In the next six days, it dashed a further 200 miles to the Yugoslav border at Ternu Severin. From here, the Soviets launched a giant flanking maneuver against the Axis defenders of Hungary. By the 24th of September, the southeast salient of Hungary had been removed, and the Russians advanced to within 100 miles of Budapest. Further south, the Yugoslav capital Belgrade was liberated with the aid of the Yugoslavian resistance under Tito. Bulgaria, until now at war only with Britain and the United States, was pressurized by Germany into declaring war on the USSR as well. Four days after this declaration of the 5th of September, the Bulgarians surrendered. Further west, Slovakia, formerly a co-belligerent of Germany, had been in a state of upheaval since the previous year. A general uprising began in the second half of 1944, but a Russian advance which began in September was held up in the Carpathians by stiff German resistance and failed to reach Slovakia before the middle of October. By then, the 65,000-strong uprising had been quelled. 
the by now sickeningly familiar results of Nazi barbarity greeted Russian liberators, and more than 200 mass graves had been filled with slaughtered Slovaks. In the north, an armistice was concluded with Finland, and the Germans were driven back into Norway before climatic conditions put an end to the fighting there. The Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania were overrun, and the German army group north isolated in the Kurland Peninsula. By January 1945, with all German troops finally driven from the holy soil of Mother Russia, and Stalin in control of the Balkans and the Baltic states, the Red Army prepared for its final drive towards the Reich. Between June and November, the German army in the east had suffered over one million casualties. 214,000 killed and 626,000 missing in action. Nineteen forty four had proved Germany's most disastrous year of the war in the East. A hundred and six divisions had been destroyed, three more than the total number mobilized in September nineteen thirty nine. German intelligence estimated that in the assault on the Reich, the Red Army would possess a superiority of eleven to one in infantry, seven to one in tanks, and twenty to one in guns. Hitler dismissed such estimates as bluff. On the 12th of January, the Soviets launched their expected offensive from the Vistula against the German Central Front. The 70 divisions of Army Group Center and Army Group A were pierced over an area of 200 miles, and almost 200 divisions of the Red Army poured through the breach. By the end of the month, Soviet forces reached the lower reaches of the River Oder and were now only 40 miles from Berlin. The remnants of Army Group Center had been encircled in East Prussia. Falling back on the ancient city of Königsberg, they pathetically attempted to carry out Hitler's orders to defend the region to the last man. The Soviet tide was finally halted on the line of the rivers Oda and Neisse in February. But the limited German counterstroke was merely postponing the inevitable. A fresh Russian offensive in Hungary progressed to the borders of Austria by April the 1st, and six days later, the outskirts of Vienna were coming under Soviet fire. To the north, on April the 16th, the final thrust towards Berlin was begun. On the first day of the assault alone, 42,000 artillery pieces and mortars fired 2,450 freight car loads of shells toward the German lines. Zhukov, excited at the prospect of being the first Soviet commander to reach Berlin, described the opening of the attack. Thousands of multicolored rockets flew into the air. At the signal, 140 searchlights, stationed at every 200 meters, were turned on. The field of battle was flooded by light, blinding the enemy and spotlighting the targets for our attacking tanks and infantry. It was an impressive sight. I don't remember anything in my life to rival the sensation. Having retreated to the capital, Hitler alternated between vitriolic outbursts about betrayal and demonic delight in the Holocaust which was descending on Germany. In the words of Admiral Speer, he deliberately attempted to make everything perish with him. He had reached a state in which, as far as he was concerned, the end of his own life meant the end of the world. Goebbels shared his manic sentiments. Under the ruins of our demolished cities, the accomplishments of the stupid 19th century lie buried. Our end will be the end of the whole universe. <laughs> 
According to the historian Trevor Roper, Hitler and Goebbels called upon the German people to destroy their towns and factories, blow up their bridges and dams and the railway and all the rolling stock for the sake of a legend, the twilight of the gods. In his last days, Hitler seemed like a cannibal god, rejoicing in the ruin of his own temples. Almost his last orders were for execution, prisoners to be slaughtered. His old surgeon was to be murdered. His own brother was to be executed. All traitors, without further specification, were to die. Like an ancient hero, Hitler wished to be sent with human sacrifices to the grave. Army, state, and economic leaders tried to mediate Hitler's destructiveness with varying degrees of success. By the 22nd of April, with Russian troops now fighting on the streets of the German capital, the insanity was about to end. But the street warfare in Berlin was bitter. The threat of a Bolshevik invasion had been hyped by the Nazi propaganda machine as the end of Germany and the German people. Even in the last chaotic days of the Reich, there was a common joke: enjoy the war while you can. The peace will be terrible. Lothar Löwe, at 16 years of age, was defending the city in an anti-tank unit armed with bazookas. We began to believe what Goebbels had said so often: if the Russians invaded, they would kill everyone, and whoever wasn't killed would be sent to the mines in Siberia, and whoever was sent there would never come back. Every civilized, organized form of life would come to an end. It was a bad war. The nights when the women in the occupied side streets were raped by the Russian soldiers were awful. The screams were horrible. There were terrible scenes. But these, on the other hand, only encouraged us all the more. We were genuinely afraid the Russians would slaughter us. They didn't take prisoners. On the night of the 28th of April, with the Russian forces grinding ever closer to his headquarters, Hitler married his mistress Eva Braun. After the wedding meal, he retired to write his last will and testament. He defiantly reaffirmed his belief in Lebensraum, and indulged in one final caustic attack on the Jewish race. On the afternoon of the 30th of April. Having made his farewells, he poisoned his wife and his dog, and shot himself. The Hitler's bodies were burned on a petrol-soaked pyre, to be joined the following night by Doctor and Frau Goebbels and the six children they had poisoned. On the same evening that Hitler committed suicide, Sergeants Yagorov and Kantaria planted the victory banner of the Soviet flag on the Reichstag. At 22:50 hours, it symbolized the triumph of the Soviet Union over Nazi Germany. It was hard to believe that less than four years previously, an SS private had written to his wife in Munich. We are now a distance of 30 kilometers from Moscow, and can see some of its spires. Soon we will have surrounded it. And then we will be billeted in sumptuous winter quarters, and I will send you presents that will make Aunt Minna green with envy. The German invasion, depicted so vividly in Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony, as naked evil in all its stupendous, arrogant inhumanity, a terrifying power overrunning Russia, had been turned back upon itself and finally crushed. But the cost had been horrendous. By the 8th of May, when the German Act of Surrender was ratified at Russian headquarters in Berlin, 28 million Russians, one in seven of the population, had died as a direct result of the war. They had died as soldiers, partisans, prisoners of war, slaves, or innocent civilians. <laughs> 
they had met their end through bombs, bullets, hunger, torture, burning and exposure. Less than 5% of the young people aged from 17 to 21 had survived. For each of the 1,418 days of the war, almost 19,000 Russian people had perished. The German invaders destroyed or burnt 1,700 towns and more than 70,000 villages and hamlets, decommissioned 60% of the steelworks and 60% of the coal mines, destroyed 65,000 kilometers of railway lines and 4,100 stations, 36,000 communication centers and tens of thousands of state farms. They looted and demolished 40,000 medical establishments, 84,000 schools and 43,000 public libraries. 25 million people had been left homeless. But in the end, the Germans had been defeated. Throughout Europe, Germans from the SS, the army and the civil administration were put on trial for offences committed during the Nazi occupation. However, the numbers punished and the severity of their sentences was astonishingly limited given the massive scale of the crimes against humanity which had occurred. Even though the Russian government had the right to hold its own trials under Article 10 of the Four Power Ordinance, none took place. Stalin was far more concerned about taking vengeance on traitors to the Soviet Union. Some 250,000 prisoners of war, now in Allied hands, were Soviet citizens who had been captured in German uniform. Under agreements affirmed at the Yalta Conference in 1945, those accused of treason or desertion were to be returned to their native countries for judgment. Those who had fought for the Germans were now forcibly repatriated. Some took the only escape route open to them and committed suicide. The Soviet authorities regarded them as human scum and treated them with a barbarity which reflected their hatred. Another two and a quarter million Russian prisoners of war had been captured during the occupation or had surrendered on the field of battle. Tragically, Russian administrators seemed to view their very survival as an act of treachery. Many who had lived through years of gruesome warfare and the savage, inhuman degradation of the German work camps were now to meet their end in the penal colonies of their own motherland. Inside Russia, the pre-war status quo was rapidly re-established and strengthened. The cult of Stalin as a personalization of victory ensured that his position as dictator of an authoritarian centralized society was unassailable. The reforms and liberalizations which had occurred during the organized chaos of the war years were gradually retracted. Religious toleration, a greater modicum of democratic involvement in civilian administration, and the virtues of individual and collective initiative became incompatible with the need of the entrenched elite to control all aspects of societal development. Besides, a new enemy was now emergent. The Cold War with the United States meant that for the best part of the next 10 years, Russia remained on a partial war footing. The major resources of the economy were poured into the military industrial sector, and the reward of the Russian people for their absolute wartime sacrifices was the call for further selfless devotion to the state. The rebuilding of the ravaged nation would have to wait. But none of this should detract from the awesome achievement of the Soviet people. Through their bravery, their labor and their sacrifice, they managed to halt and eventually crush 
a seemingly invincible war machine which, with chilling efficiency, had conquered almost the entire Western European continent in a matter of months. They annihilated a German army which had unleashed in its wake a regime of apocalyptic terror, a tyranny which had turned vast tracts of Europe into a surreal playground of sadists and perverts. The victory of the Soviet people may not have ensured an era of justice and democratic ideals, but it rid the world of the cancerous malignancy of national socialism, which had for long periods threatened to engulf it.